Northampton City Council meeting December 7th, 2017. I'm City Council President Bill Dwight, and I will be presiding this evening. Um, we will start uh, before we convene with our usual custom of uh, allowing the public to comment and speak to any topic of their choosing. It doesn't have to be something that's itemized on our agenda. We ask that you follow a few um, basic rules. Uh, first is that please keep your remarks under three minutes. Um, the other thing is that we ask when you uh, step up, please identify yourself and give us your address. You do not have to be a Northampton resident, but we need this for the public record because this point, in fact, is a public record. Um, we also ask that you respect the decorum of the chamber, uh, despite it might not be all that discernible to most, but we do have a decorum. We have, we um, principally concerned about speaking about people who are not public figures by name. Um, that actually is, we are public figures. You can speak about us. You can even defame us. It's allowed by law. Um, but please don't do it obscenely. Uh, not because we're so sensitive, but it's we, that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying the decorum of the chamber. And um, I think with that, we, we have a sign up list. The uh, one thing is you can see there are a lot of people here who are interested in speaking tonight. In the interest of time, if you hear somebody say something that you agree with, you're welcome to say ditto, which will give you more opportunity to expand on a different subject if you want. Um, but that's not required. Uh, but it would, it, it would help move things along. We have a long evening ahead of us. So, but that's not to dismiss the relevance or importance of what you are about to say to us. So starting off, the first person we si have signed up is Kitty Callahan. And I saw Kitty, there's Kitty. Oh, and also one other caveat, just to let you know, for folks who haven't experienced this before, the council is constrained from speaking. Our rules require that we don't say boo. Uh, this is your turn to speak. You, the, if you want to hear our, our voices, you'll have plenty of opportunity if you stick around because we'll be talking ad nauseum. But in this instance, this is your time. Please any, understand if you direct a question to us, we won't be able to answer. It's not because we're ignoring you. It's because we're not allowed under our rules. Kitty, thank you. I'm sorry about interrupting there. All right. So my name is Kitty Calligan, and I'm from Florence. And I'm here speaking in support of the um, resolution in support of the, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Um, it, the resolution is, is talking about legislation that's pending. And also there, there's a ballot question um, that hopefully will be on the ballot in, in um, November um, in support of raising the minimum wage, which is now $11 an hour, to $15 an hour in stages um, until, and I guess it will be $15 an hour in 2022. Um, $11 an hour is, is, n is not enough to make ends meet. Um, I'm on the steer steering committee of Living Wage Western Mass, and um, we have been running a living wage program in, in Northampton and also one in Western Massachusetts um, for several years. And in Northampton, the, um, the living wage rate for 2017 has been $13.36 an hour. This rate is based on a bare bones budget for one person. Now, there are many people who are earning a living wage that are supporting more than themselves. Um, and so that's one reason why we seriously have to consider a $15 minimum wage. Um, Northampton has very high housing costs. The average rent is nine, $975. And someone who's earning $11 an hour simply cannot afford a rent at $975 a month. Um, raising the minimum wage will benefit everyone. Um, it benefits employers. Employers with higher rage, wages um, paying higher wages will retain experienced workers. It reduces their turnover costs. It, it will boost the morale of the employees when they feel that <clears throat> they're, they're earning a wage that helps them to make ends meet and helps them to feel that they're appreciated. It also helps the families of, of 
of low wage workers. Um, not only are they making ends meet in a better, um, more able to make ends meet, um, but they also um, are more, the family is more healthy, there's less stress, there's, le there's less illness. And it also benefits the community. So if workers ha have more wages, they will be able to put more money in, in the local community. In addition, <clears throat> they will not have to rely so much on public programs from the state and the federal government. And, and that will bring in more money for state and federal programs that can benefit the community, such as infrastructure. You know, we, we still, we did a lot of work on the roads, but we still need a lot more on, on those kind of things. And also for education. Um, so I hope that, that the resolution that has been proposed will be, will be passed by this city council tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Fred Zimmer. Uh, my name is Fred Zimnock. I live at 23 Pomeroy Terrace. Uh, a remark by mayoral candidate John Riley led me to ponder what aspects of Northampton might be a tourist attraction. So I went to our website and visited Northampton slash city government slash visitors page and saw that our cultural, artistic, and independent retailers are emphasized, but little is mentioned about our remarkable history since the time of our founding fathers. Thinking about what else might be added, might be worthwhile for Northampton as a tourist attraction, led me to consider the following singular event. On Tuesday, August 29th, 1786, former Revolutionary War veteran Captain Luke Day of West Springfield led a group of farmers, veterans, and town folk from the Goodman's Ferry at the banks of the Connecticut River down our Bridge Street. They marched to Fife and Drum, hoping to prevent jurists at Clark's Tavern which I believe was over on Holly Street, from holding the quarterly sessions of the Court of Common Pleas. These jurists had the power to foreclose on farmers' mortgages and other debts. This was especially likely since the poll tax had been exorbitantly raised to pay for the Commonwealth's war debt. As they marched down our Bridge Street, they were, they were watched by Sheriff Eliza Porter, who was unable to alert the militia and knew he was powerless to prevent them from agitating against sitting of the court. As the day progressed and the crowd grew, the jurists relented and postponed their meeting to the next quarter. This was the first action of Shays' Rebellion. While their subsequent actions did not accomplish their stated mission, their actions did cause alarm with the elders, leaders of the American Revolution, including George Washington. These concerns were reflected in actions taken at the convention in Philadelphia, where Alexander Hamilton set up the first national bank that issued bonds to sop up all the Revolutionary War debt. A small effort to produce a plaque with appropriate words could be erected at the site of the old courthouse, and Clark's Tavern would not only be worthwhile history lesson, but a compelling tourist attraction as well. In Shays' Rebellion popular, Marie Panic, the archivist at Historic Northampton, told me that Google Analytics says that Shays' Rebellion gets the most hits on their website. The event also commemorates the birth of the Daily Hampshire Gazette. Since the first issue was published by <coughs> William Butler on Wednesday, September 6, 1786, was motivated by Shays' Rebellion. I'm sure the idea could be expanded to other sites and buildings of historic interest to add to the tourist attraction of our city, something you should consider. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, James Winston, please. Good evening. Oh, time's up. <laughs> I'm kidding. But like she's reset. <laughs> okay. Reset the clock. Off you go. Um, James Winston, uh, Northampton. Um, I am here, um, again, uh, voicing an opposition to the proposed ordinance that would restrict um, the safety cameras in Northampton. I, I really can't say it any more eloquently than City Councilor Dennis Bidwell did in his closing comments uh, last month. So I refer you to his arguments. 
there. Um, but really where I'm coming at this is from a little bit of a different angle uh, in terms of whether the council even has authority. And so what I'm looking at is a, um, it's a memorandum uh, to uh, the mayor from our Northampton City Solicitor, Attorney Alan Seawald. And so I'm, I'm just going to read from part of it to make sure uh, I have it read ver verbatim. But the relevant parts, it's my opinion that the City Council does not have the authority pursuant to the City of Northampton Charter to direct and control the day-to-day -day operations of a city agency, like the police department, and that the proposed ordinance would be inconsistent with the Charter. Uh, the Charter provides a complete separation of powers between an executive branch headed by the mayor and a legislative branch consisting of the City Council. Um, it is, uh, in, in this type of a city government, the City Council's authority is limited largely to a check on the mayor's executive function through the power of appropriation. And he cites a City Council um, case, City Council of Boston versus Mayor of Boston. That's a Supreme Judicial Court case. Specifically, the Charter prohibits the City Council or any member of the City Council from giving, quote, orders or directions to any employee of the city appointed by the mayor, such as the police chief, either publicly or privately. The power is vested solely in the mayor, who is mandated to, quote, exercise general supervision and direction over all city agencies unless otherwise provided by law or charter. Um, specifically, the charter clearly places the authority to set policies as to direct the day-to-day -day operations of any city agency, again, including the police department, or employee, including the police chief, with the mayor. And any attempt by the council to exercise their prerogatives would be beyond their powers. So I, I respectfully submit to the council that the Northampton Charter doesn't give this council the, the, the authority to, to uh, pass this type of ordinance. The, the police department is obviously a city agency. The police chief is obviously a city employee. Uh, I, I think the, the wording from the city solicitor is clear. This was a very similar issue that he directed his, his letter to Mayor Narkowitz. It, it's almost exactly on point. Um, I, I would also dare say that if, if, if this council uh, took the pulse of, of property owners downtown, there is a real concern about, about safety, of not having these cameras downtown. There's, um, there, there's a right of, of, of business owners or property owners to be able to conduct their businesses without, um, without fear that things are going to happen in the middle of the night and we're not going to be able to, uh, to have any record of what, what happened. I think that um, the idea, the kind of like the paranoia that if we have cameras that you know, somebody in Washington, D.C. is going to seek to have surveillance images of people walking downtown and that's going to cause uh, problems in the city is, is just not realistic. Um, I, I can tell you that uh, building that my family owns has, has cameras um, in front um, for security purposes. And there are several, several times where the, the police department seeks to um, see what just happened. Recently, somebody ran out of a store a couple of businesses away and stole a woman's purse, and they wanted to see what direction that person ran. Um, another incident, somebody dropped his wallet, and they wanted to see what happened. And I just have a limited view. But just think of how many times the police, in their investigations, whether it was Eva Traeger Memorial that got smashed, and they were trying to, to find who did that. Uh, think of the, the deterrence value that would have. And I would ask you to, to follow um, City Councilor uh, Dennis Bidwell's strong arguments and, and vote against the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Charles DeRose, please. <coughs> My name is Charlie DeRose. I live at 677 North Farms Road. And I know tonight you're going to be voting on a proposal to restrict, restrict the use of surveillance 
um, you're being asked to choose between helping the police do their job or protecting civil liberties. Not an easy choice. Um, I spent my whole working career close to freedom of speech issues, so I'm very sympathetic with your challenge. Um, if you vote yes tonight, you are effectively saying that the risk of misusing technology is more important than its advantage. Chief Casper has pointed out that neighboring communities, including Amherst, Westfield, and Chicopee, are increasing their surveillance because it helps them to solve or prevent crime. <clears throat> if you vote no tonight, you're leaving the door open to discussion of specific surveillance issues if and when they come up. So I urge you to vote no. Thank you for Thank the you opportunity to address you. Thank you. Um, Wendy Saviano. Okay, my name is Wendy Saviano, and I live at 270 Crescent Street in Northampton. I'd like to thank the Northampton City Council for endorsing the resolution calling on the United States to pull back from the brink and prevent nuclear war. Um, I hope on the second consideration, the resolution will again be approved and it is vital to all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Carl Saviano. Good evening, my name is Carl Saviano. I live on Crescent Street and uh, I'm a member of Physicians for Social Responsibility. I'm here to thank the council for supporting Dr. Ira Helfand's call to stop the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, and I hope you will vote again unanimously in favor of the resolution calling for the, the United States to pull back from the brink and prevent nuclear war. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dan Chard, please. Hi there, my name is Dan Chard and I live in Ward 3 on Swan Street. Um, and this is my first time at a city council meeting. I have young children, so it's difficult for me to attend, but my wife took on some extra bedtime responsibilities with the help of my mother-in-law to support me in coming here because we all feel very strongly that we'd like to um, s urge you to continue a yes vote on their surveillance bill. And I say, I, I'm speaking partially from somebody who's a historian and I, I work at UMass in the history department and I, my research is on <coughs> policing, counterterrorism and US politics since 19, since World War II. And um, the reasons why I don't want surveillance I don't think we, we need surveillance cameras downtown. One, I have not heard um, any, I've not seen any evidence that this is gonna make our community safer. And I don't think that the public should be under, um, underwriting through our tax dollars these, these cameras because business owners want them downtown it, when there's not evidence that it's going to make our community safer. But what, what, what else is compelling to me about the many people who've really been kind of mobilizing people in our community uh, around this issue is that um, since the 1970s, a trend of dealing with social conflict and prime, problems of crime and uh, of political violence has been to deal with these issues through policing and surveillance and incarceration. Since 9-11, we spend over a trillion dollars on the Department of Homeland Security. And um, there's, there's more federal agencies dedicated to counterterrorism, for example, than there are actual people who've been arrested on terrorism and um, charges. There's, there's, we have, you know, more people incarcerated than um, any country of, that's ever existed in human history, um, both per capita and by numbers. So we don't have control here in Northampton at our city council over foreign policy, although I would love to see us sign this statement against nuclear war, and I appreciate those who brought it to the table. And we can't, can, we, and 
um, you know, we can't get Medicare for all and all of the other things that we need to get rid of the, the gross economic inequality and that we have in our, our community, but we can take steps to move in a direction of being a society that in which everyone's needs are, be, needs are being met and some of the root causes of conflict and inequality can be ameliorated through those levels. And so I would like to move in that direction. And I'm surprised that the mayor is talking about vetoing this. I voted for him twice. And if he's listening, I, um, I would hope that, that he would rethink the, the how wise it is to make that decision in the town that voted overwhelmingly for built Bernie Sanders instead of Hillary Clinton. And I, um, I would think twice about voting for him if he does this veto, if there is a more progressive qualified candidate. Thank you very much. Um, Suzanne, Suzanne Beck, please. So my name again is Suzanne Beck, and I'm representing the Greater Northampton Chamber of Commerce tonight. I was really impressed at the last council meeting by the public comment um, about the camera ordinance, especially because you heard a breadth of uh, perspectives that you hadn't heard in the past, and I really applaud the people that came forward um, to give those perspectives. And that has continued over the last couple of weeks. There's been some great guest columns and letters to the editor published in the Gazette. And I would, get you've heard, I would guess that you've heard from many people um, who've sent you emails. I was disappointed, however, in your vote two weeks ago um, and hope that tonight's vote will better represent the range of opinions that you've heard. There is a step that I think is, can acknowledge everybody's um, perspectives on the issue and respects and reconciles those opinions and opens the possibility for alternatives um, on this. And that is the compromise to defeat the ordinance. Defeating the ordinance, as you well know, will not undermine your authority on whether cameras can and should be permitted. Defeating the ordinance will give the council the chance to work with Chief Casper on alternatives. And this is especially important in this case because the resolution and the ordinance were submitted two days after the public forum and preempted any chance of a compromise or further discussion that would lead to a compromise. There are a lot of people, and you've heard from them on all sides of this issue, who are disturbed about the process. And there are many people, and you've heard from them, that are concerned that a vote to support the ordinance is a vote to ratify this process. So there are two benefits to defeating the ordinance. One is that it doesn't undermine your authority on your decision making about cameras. And the second is that it sends a message that acknowledges the flaws in the process that you followed on this particular issue. Actions that signal the importance of bridging a divided issue really matter, especially now. And a vote to defeat the ordinance is an action that says the council is committed to govern with an open-minded process that takes all perspectives on an issue equally into account. And, and making your decision making with that commitment. This is a really, really important message to send. And I hope you'll consider that in your vote tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dana Goldblatt, please. My name is Dana Goldblatt. I live at 140 Williams Street. Uh, Today I'm going to pull out my lawyer bona fides for just a minute, because in addition to being opposed to uh, permanent 24-hour high-definition surveillance up and down Main Street in Northampton, I'm also a lawyer. And I've heard multiple times that this body doesn't have the right or the authority to draft legislation, and that seemed weird to me, because you're the legislator. Mm -hmm. So I read the city charter, and you do. It says it in the charter. I read it. You're fine. <laughs> so I don't know what everyone's talking about that something in the charter says separation of powers means you can't, because you can. So if that's an issue, I hope that lays it to rest, because I'm a lawyer too. Now, moving on. I was surprised at the tone of the response to the proposal to ban, uh, not ban, but drastically restrict the amount of cameras that could be downtown. 
because the reasons that people brought forward that the cameras made them unsafe, the cameras made them uncomfortable, the cameras were traumatizing, the cameras were changing the vibe of downtown in a bad way, those were such important considerations that if somebody brought that forward, I was really surprised that people were dismissing that as paranoia or as hysteria. And it seemed, I thought, these people are being jerks. <laughs> And then, I, then uh, after four or five of these meetings, I realized I'm being a jerk. Because in the issue of whether or not to do snapping when people are to support people, I heard that the snapping was making some people uncomfortable. I heard that the snapping was distracting to some people. And I thought, meh, it doesn't distract me. It's not uncomfortable for me. I don't know what everyone's on about. And I ignored it. Sure, it's a rule, but who cares? I don't, I'm, I'm not doing it and I'm not gonna bother other people. Who are, it's not my issue because it doesn't bother me. And all the people who it does bother, there must be something wrong with. I then found out that the reason the snap, part of the reason the snapping is distracting is for anyone with any assisted hearing issues, the snapping is actually really painful. It causes a problem with the device. And then I thought, oh, well that's a real reason. So now I'm gonna, uh, now I'm gonna tell people not to snap. And then I thought, oh, I was being a jerk because it turns out I wasn't willing to change what I was gonna do unless someone else's reason was good enough for me. What, you need a doctor's note for me to take seriously when you say something's painful? No, I should just listen to that and say, okay, we need a public space that everyone can feel comfortable in. So if you're saying that this is a really serious issue for you, I'm gonna take that on board. And I'm going to try to work to make the public space comfortable for everybody. So it sort of opened my eyes as to how easy it is when something doesn't resonate with you personally to not listen and to wind up being kind of a jerk. So I'd like to ask in this context, let's not be jerks. We've heard a lot of people say this is bad for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Douglas Rupp? Not Rupp, I know you. I'm sorry, Douglas, I couldn't read your last name. Good evening, fellow honorable city council members. I'm Douglas Ross, and I live in the city of East Hampton at 391 Main Street, apartment 101. And there are two reasons why I think you people on the city council need to pass this surveillance ordinance. The first reason is, and this is probably more of a personal one, is that I have seen you guys pass resolution after resolution for years without any backbone or without any substance to the resolutions and I became tired of it. But now, this is your chance now. This is your chance to shine. This is your chance to prove to the city of Northampton that you are more than about resolutions. You are about action. You are about getting things done. And the second reason, and I think this is something that has not been discussed with anybody at all, is there are a lot of people with disabilities around here. People with disabilities who may act in a non-neurotypical way, can you imagine, for example, if you're walking down Main Street and you've seen somebody going back and forth five or six times, you know, they're just wandering around, whatever, and they're on camera and the police officer says, hmm, I wonder what that person is doing. I'm going to go and check them out. Not realizing that that person might have a disability. That might be their way of coping. So those are the two reasons why I think you need to pass the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Rick Hart, please. Hi, my name is Rick Hart. Uh, I live at 68 Leonard Street in Leeds. Hello, Elisa. <laughs> Oops, sorry, no names. Um, I'm downtown a great deal of the time, both for myself and in relation to a nonprofit that I work with that has a lot of clients on the streets. Um, so about this ordinance, about the cameras, um, as it happens, I, I'm a big fan of both the mayor and, and the police chief. I think they're great but I think they're wrong about this. Um, I think that it's, uh, I really would like them to uh, reconsider what they're doing and also if the mayor vetoes, I hope that you will hold firm and, and uh, override the veto. Uh, I, for me, it's a civil liberties issue. Um, in, I'm gonna read this part because I won't get it all straight. Increased surveillance of so society and control over private lives have often been represented as positive. That's the old, will be safer thing. Uh, important to increase public safety, law, and order. Repressive governments of the left and right have justified their actions this way. But history shows that all governments tend to overreach in their effort to enforce an orderly society. Local governments, national governments, our government. 
Um, we need constant vigilance to prevent a gradual erosion of our civil liberties. This is not an unrealistic fear. In the last several decades, our own government has repeatedly tried to conduct data sweeps and intrusions on privacy. I can say this from personally from my professional experience as a public librarian. Um, security agencies have repeatedly tried to get libraries to release all their records on people. Everything. They just blanket all the people and they want all the records and what they're using and what they're taking out. So libraries have had to fight for years to keep that confidential unless there's a legitimate subpoena. Um, so I think even if it helps win an occasional conviction for a specific crime, which it probably would, it's not worth setting the precedent of increased surveillance of the general public. I don't think this is the direction our society should be moving, of surveillance, whether, whether it's for safety or any other reason. Um, and so I hope that you will stand firm with the vote you made before. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Kevin Young, please. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Kevin Young, 3 Edwards Square. Um, I very much appreciate the comments that have been made on uh, nuclear weapons and uh, the $15 minimum wage, but I'm going to speak uh, about the, uh, the surveillance cameras. Um, I have three brief reasons for uh, opposing the installation of more uh, surveillance cameras in the downtown area. Um, first and most importantly, um, it's easy for some of us who are white and documented and from middle class backgrounds uh, to be dismissive about the threats posed by agencies like Immigration and Customs Enfor Enforcement and our <coughs> predator in chief in the White House. But for undocumented immigrants, including here in Massachusetts, uh, the terror uh, and the, the threat of um, federal uh, anti-immigrant policy is very real. That's something that we need to take seriously and not be dismissive of. In late September, ICE uh, detained um, 50 Massachusetts residents uh, as part of the Orwellian <coughs> named Operation Safe City. Um, and its detentions and uh, uh, deportation uh, processes have uh, continued since then, including here in western Massachusetts, in Holyoke and Hatfield and elsewhere. Uh, people are being terrorized uh, by this predatorial anti-immigrant agency. And it's of vital importance that we here in a progressive community like Northampton take strong and decisive action uh, in defiance of this federal policy. Uh, so the vulnerability of uh, the immigrant population locally is the main reason I have for, for opposing the installation of more security cameras. Uh, the second is a matter of, of principle having to do with privacy. Uh, at a time when uh, our national government and many governments around the world, as well as giant corporations, are increasing the use of surveillance that violates our privacy, uh, it's again vital that we as a community step up and uh, support the right to privacy. My third reason has to do with uh, the pulse of the property owners in downtown Northampton. Um, we are often encouraged in this town to uh, assign the most importance to the voice of property owners, uh, business entrepreneurs, and the police. And I think that these voices uh, represent a very small, for, small percentage of the population. Uh, and they often exercise a disproportionate influence over public affairs. I want to live in a Northampton where all people feel safe and secure, not just the business owners and the police officers who are a tiny percentage of the population, but who seem to wield disproportionate political influence. So I'm here to speak in favor of the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Chris Kitzmiller, please. Hello, uh, my name is Chris Kitzmiller. I live on South Street in Northampton. I've been a Northampton resident for 17 years. I work at Hampshire College where I do IT work and um, <clears throat> that has allowed me to become very familiar with the way in which surveillance technology is being used both um, locally within an organization 
and also um, nationally. Um, we need to pay more attention to people who are um, telling us that they feel unsafe around these surveillance cameras. They create um, a <clears throat> dystopian community. Um, it is not Paradise City that we'll live in if we are in the Panopticon. Um, so um, uh, the, the adage I, I always refer back to when I think about this is that you cannot be safe if you have no privacy. Um, and so um, even when you are in a public space, you still have um, the right not to be complicit in the, your own surveillance. Um, we should not be funding our own surveillance through the police station. Um, so that, along with uh, uh, no nukes and a living wage of $15, would be great. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Hank Evey. Good evening, Henry Heafy, Washington Avenue here in Northampton. I've found that the issue of cameras on Main Street has been divisive for our community. Members of the council and citizens have spoken passionately about the sanctity of the public space. I also say there's another side, the safety of the public space. How many of you have recently walked into a store and spoken to the store managers? I have. And I hear words and thoughts like intimidation, Intimidation if we try to stop a fight or call the police. Fights, fights on Main Street, property damage and graffiti. Crowding, crowding in front of doorways to prevent shoppers from entering the stores if we say anything about the fights or profanity. Taking a bus, several, more, several store managers have told me that people take the bus from Holyoke because they know where they can get drugs easily. One manager even told me that one person on Main Street said, well, I've collected 200 bucks. I guess I can go home now. One manager said to me, I have a 10-year lease. I can't leave if business goes bad. People, especially older people, have called me and said they're not coming downtown because they don't feel safe. And then I think it's interesting that published on Mass Live on September 1st of this year, the following. Two Northampton men arrested by the district attorney's office, the state police, and the Northampton police <coughs> on, on a warrant at about 3.30 in the morning at 187 Main Street, which is across from City Hall. Now the charges on one of the two individuals, possession of a shotgun and a rifle without FID cards, possession of ammunition without an FID card as a person with two prior convictions for violent crimes or serious drug offenses, possession of 57 bags of heroin with intent to distribute, second or subsequent offense, possession of marijuana with intent to distribute, second or subsequent offense, Possession of 52 oxycontin pills with intent to distribute, second or subsequent offense. Manufacturing of tetrahydrocannabinol, second or subsequent offense. Manufacturing cultivation of marijuana plants, second or subsequent offense. Conspiracy to violate drug laws. And this was across from City Hall. I asked the council to give equal consideration to the store owners, the managers, and the patrons for their safety in particular, and those, as well as those who hang out in the downtown area. Find a balance. We want everyone to feel safe. We want everyone to be included. We want our small businesses to be successful. Why do we have to rush this issue? Please, don't close the door tonight without a further discussion and consideration. And so I urge you to vote no. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kevin Lake, please. Hi, uh, Kevin Lake, 35 Washington Avenue. Uh, these are somewhat abbreviated comments for, that uh, were published in the Gazette yesterday. Many evangelicals have a moral certainty that homosexuality is an abomination and want that to be the basis of law. Many people have a moral certainty that a woman's right to control her own body equates to murder when it comes to terminating a pregnancy. Moral certainty and righteousness exist in many forms and must always be distrusted as a basis for social policy. Most of all, in a democracy, it cannot be the governing basis on which our legislators create law. 
This is obvious to us in Northampton when it applies to conservative politicians, but I raise it here because the following has happened. Within a couple of days of the Northampton Police Chief proposal for security cameras, this council drafted a resolution that stated that such cameras are, quote, inconsistent with an open and democratic society. No hearings had yet been held and no discovery had yet taken place. This was simply the moral opinion of the drafters of the resolution. The council thereby established as its starting point the characterization of any who might support the cameras as being against an open and democratic society. In open meeting, two of the sponsors later stated that for them, quote, this was essentially an ethical issue. The problem with moral certainty is that it implies, or even asserts, that other views are immoral. It discourages or prevents objective learning. Precisely when such feelings are most strongly held, legislators need to go out of their way to listen and learn and entertain alternatives and legislate based on the merits, not on their own moral opinions. They need to genuinely and respectfully explore how people of principle and goodwill might have different views. Once you started with the morally righteous language of the resolution, you steered the entire discussion away from true community learning. You created at least the appearance of bias. Had you refrained from the resolution, had you explored with other progressive communities that do use cameras how they wrestle with the practical and ethical issues of their use, had you done all manner of vigorous research and educated us about what you learned, and then determined that the downsides of such cameras cannot be overcome, that would be another matter. As it is, you described only one path as moral, and at the end of the process, you appear to have reached the conclusion that you wanted to reach all along. I personally do not support the installation of additional cameras. However, I want to caution this council that while of course you have personal moral opinions as individuals, as legislators, your ethical responsibility is to weigh the merits, all of the merits, whether they comport with your moral certainties or not. If we demand it of conservatives, we must hold ourselves to the same standard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Blair Jimma, please. Hi, my name is Blair Gemma. I live at 3 Clark Avenue. Um, I'm reading the first of uh, three parts of a, of a public statement. Um, thank you for your work on this ordinance. It's time to call the question, and there's only one question. Do we want to limit permanent police surveillance in Northampton or not? I've heard that some people want you to change your vote because they feel that seven public meetings over three months wasn't a thorough enough process. As someone new to the city governance, I'm deeply disturbed by that idea. If this goes on any longer, you'll be excluding the voices of working people and people with family obligations. For us to participate in city governance, the process needs to be predictable and time limited. Endless meetings, endless debates, and endless postponements will have the effect of eliminating us by attrition, and that's not what democracy looks like. This fall, every point raised in favor of permanent, high-definition, 24-7 surveillance on Main Street has been aired and answered. Point one, Belchertown, East Hampton, and Amherst already have this kind of surveillance, and it works great. No, they don't. They don't have anything like this. We call the police departments. They didn't know what we were talking about or why they think uh, why they would think that we would need this kind of security apparatus. That was inaccurate information. Another point, cameras deter crime. No, they don't. They just move it around, except for car thefts and garages. London just finished an enormously expensive two-decade experiment with this kind of surveillance and deemed it a complete failure. That's coming from the London Home Office, i.e. the people who run the police. A third point that's been made, we can stop the feds from getting the footage, maybe. All electronic data collected by the municipal police is shared with the feds through a previously negotiated agreement in real time. This is not a public records issue. These are private records. Our police share them automatically with the federal government through an intricate, expensive, high-tech data transfer system. So that was inaccurate. These cameras will produce an enormous quantity of data and provide that data automatically to the FBI and ICE. Even without the automatic transfer process, public record laws don't restrict information sharing among law enforcement agencies. After 9-11, concerns about intelligence led state 
led state, local, and federal authorities to eliminate as many barriers as possible to record sharing among law enforcement en entities. They are all entangled with each other. I repeat, this is not a public records issue, and anyone who says that ICE or the FBI can't get this data is because it is not a public record is either willfully ignorant or willingly willful, willfully misleading. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Kristen Whitmore, please. Hi, uh, Kristen Whitmore, One Valley Street here in Northampton. I'm going to continue speaking to this public statement um, uh, against the surveillance cameras on Main Street. Um, I'm going to speak to this idea that police wouldn't ask for cameras if they weren't a good idea and that it's disrespectful not to do things that the police ask you to do. Um, letting the police do city planning is a disaster waiting to happen. We shouldn't be afraid to call out bad ideas just because they come from a police officer. Police, police officers are just like the rest of us. They have good ideas and they have bad ideas. And this one was a bad one, and we shouldn't be afraid to say so. Sociologists, social historians, and urban planners have turned up to tell the council, based on their expertise, these cameras will have many negative effects and will not reduce crime, any kind of crime in Northampton. And we should listen to them. At her first listening meeting at the Senior Center, Jody Casper specifically said that sociologists were the people to look to for this kind of information. She also said in her own, own practice as a police officer, she distrusts research and won't be guided by it. She feels like the cameras will help solve crime, and she's going with that. For an evidence-based approach to city planning, sociologists and city planners are the people to guide us. Let's be respectful of their work and their expertise, which they generously took the time to share with us. I'm also going to speak to this idea that the people who want to pass an, ordi an ordinance preserving public spaces from police surveillance are a bunch of crazy, noisy, unruly, uncivil, hysterical, ignorant, paranoid nut jobs who don't know what's good for them. We, the people speaking against police surveillance and in favor of the ordinance, are professors, doctors, lawyers, music musicians, artists, teachers, nurses, social workers, writers, business owners, homeowners, and workers. We've written essays, we've sent letters to the editor, we've brought and cited research from all over the world. We are also disproportionately female, queer, transgender, and people of color. The use of coded language like uncivil, hysterical, paranoid, and ignorant is deeply offensive. When a female professor of the history of security and surveillance calmly cites decades of sociology research about the negative effects of persistent, pervasive video surveillance in towns like ours, and a series of mostly older white men without her expertise repeatedly dismiss her as ignorant, hysterical, and unruly, there's more going on than a difference of opinion about policy. I would encourage you, the council, as politely as possible, to nip this nastiness in the bud. Dog whistle politics have no place in our public discourse. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gabe. It's Gabe, I live uh, on Crescent Street in Northampton. I'm going to finish the last of this statement. Um, cameras are bad and surveillance is terrible, but we shouldn't mind because of Facebook. Also, they aren't actually bad because cameras are everywhere. Anyone who isn't doing anything wrong shouldn't mind. Police cameras are just like Facebook. More of a bad thing doesn't make it good. And police surveillance is much more intrusive than that of any private person or company because police surveillance provides access to federal law enforcement automatically and without the ne necessity of a warrant. And point number seven. More or different processes would have produced consensus, so the council must have done this wrong, because if you'd done it right, everyone would be happy. Sometimes people disagree. The majority of Northamptonites are independent and privacy-minded. When the police chief indicated that this was a vision for Northampton that she was considering, we responded to express our condemnation and to make sure that didn't happen. Like you, we hate the idea of persistent government surveillance. Like you, we thought it was important to set limits on it. We trusted the city government governance process as the public democratic way to accomplish this goal. There are some people who want to leave open the possibility of expanding the current government surveillance apparatus, but they are in the minority. They have not been able to produce any research that suggests a tan tangible benefit. They have not convinced the rest of us that the dangers are phantoms of our own imagining. And so they feel, quite understandably, that there must be something wrong with the process. 
If it had gone properly, surely they would have convinced everyone they were right. But that's not how democracy works. If we leave the process open until everyone feels happy with the outcome, we will never do anything important. But we will effectively exclude working people from this process and any future process. Because working people don't have endless time to participate in an open-ended project of self-governance and no, and no predictable procedures. After three months, there's no new research out there to change our minds. It's time to call the question. And the question is, do we want to limit permanent police surveillance in Northampton? Every, everything else is a red herring. Please vote yes again, and again, and again, and again, as necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Patty Healy, please. Hi, my name is Patty Healy, 21 Longfellow Drive in Florence. And first, I just want to say, as a resident and one who comes to these meetings only occasionally, I'm really impressed with the eloquence and intelligence of the speakers. Uh, I, I've been really, I learned a lot tonight from everybody who prepared. It, it's amazing. But I'm here to speak in favor of uh, the resolution um, to support the $15 minimum wage in Massachusetts. Uh, I know it's late. I'll try and be quick with my thoughts. Um, as a, I'm a unionized worker, but 93% of Americans are not unionized, so they no longer have a voice a, a, as an organized group of workers in their workplace. And there's been, uh, the research shows that with the inequality that has uh, been wider in the United States over the years, the uh, membership in unions has dropped, and so has the minimum wage. It's almost exactly on the same uh, level on the same graph. Um, and given that, um, you know, w there's a movement, a national movement, to raise the minim minimum wage, I just want to remind you that the proposal before us in the state and here in the resolution is for an absolutely minimal incremental increase in minimum wage. It means that um, by the time we get to 2022, when the minimum wage gets up to $15 an hour, just think about what the cost of living is going to be right now. Mm -hmm. And and the other part of my thinking is that um, we face enormous inequality here in this town. Um, you know, there are uh, most workers uh, in this town, uh, 30, at least 30 percent of the workers to 40 percent of the workers work two jobs. Um, no one can live on the minimum wage that we have right now, and we know that it's been very clearly um, documented by numerous studies, economists, <coughs> and so on. Um, I know that this is going before, the, I know the state is looking the, at this question and I'm hopeful that this incremental change will happen, but I think it's imperative that a community supports the people who live here and supports those who don't have a voice. And those are workers who are not unionized, um, poor, the people who are affected by the gross inequality that we have in our country. And um, I believe that our economy and our community only uh, will be better um, if we can support and somehow um, uh, improve the lives of the people who, who live here. So I ask you to vote yes in support of the $15 minimum wage um, resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do L.B. Berger, please. Um, L.B. Berger, I live at 35 Clark Street in Ward 6. Uh, recently moved to Northampton a little over two months ago, and in the short time, I felt more at home here than anywhere else I've lived. I'm really proud to live in a city with engaged and concerned citizens and a dedicated council that makes decisions <laughs> with integrity. So I thank you for voting yes on the camera ordinance, maintaining the character and safety of the city that I'm happy to call home. I also urge you to vote yes on the $15 minimum wage. I'm also here to deliver a public statement on behalf of Sarah Field of 40 Elizabeth Street. I will begin her statement. Just Johnson, Johnson, who is speaking after me, will finish it. I'm writing to you with regard to your second vote tonight on the ordinance that will limit the use of poli police surveillance cameras in downtown Northampton. I am unable to attend the meeting due to work travel. As I have shared in previous council meetings, I strongly support the ordinance because the data clearly shows that there are few potential benefits to the installation of police cameras and many significant problems associated with them. I appreciate the care, attention, discussion, and research that you as a council have brought to bear throughout this process and urge you to vote yes on the ordinance. I know that you have already heard many of the most important arguments that have already been made about the problematic nature of the use of permanent police surveillance cameras. Because of that, I would like to address an issue that I think may be bubbling underneath this debate. 
I understand, based on discussions with local business owners in our community, that a number of downtown retail businesses are struggling financially and are looking for <coughs> solutions, and that cameras have been proposed as of assistance to their struggling business. I also know that there are many local business owners who do not want cameras and who see cameras as a threat to the welcoming downtown culture that we are trying to create. As someone who has owned my own business in the past, I absolutely sympathize with the business owners who are trying to make a living in challenging economic times and who are seeking to explore every possible solution. That said, I don't think that the financial struggles our local businesses face are due to the people who spend time downtown and who would be surveilled by these cameras as much as they are due to the rise of corporate retailers and online commerce. Police cameras are simply not a viable or evidence-based solution for the major challenges our local economy is facing. I worry that what is happening in our community is reflective of a larger national and global trend. Good people, faced with economic anxiety, misunderstand the source of these problems and consequently identify solutions that are not just ineffective, but are actually harmful. Police surveillance cameras like border walls and travel bans are symbols, distractions, and mechanisms of control that provide some members of our society with a false sense of security while causing a great deal of harm to others. They are not solutions, they are not going to help us achieve safety or financial st stability, and they are not going to help us heal or push back on the actual threats to our community's economic vibrancy. Cameras are not going to convince anyone to stop shopping online and start shopping locally. They are not going to provide more people with living wages so that they can afford to support local businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yes, it seems that Jess Johnson is next. So. <laughs> So yeah, my, my name is Jess Johnson, and um, I live at 119 Meadow Street, and I I'm, I'm, will be finishing the public statement um, by Sarah Field. So to carry on, um, they are not going to help people who are struggling with addiction to be people who are not struggling with addiction. They're not going to make downtown safe. We face a vital choice about how to move forward as a community. We can continue to focus on solutions like cameras that don't address the core issues and that lead to, to divisiveness and potential mistrust or fear. Alternatively, we can choose to devote Northampton's incomparable passion, energy, brilliance, and resources to the work of revitalizing and reinventing our local economy <coughs> in a way that works for everyone, including those who are struggling the most right now. We can choose to imagine and then implement solutions that are about sharing power and resources and building a creative, vibrant, and self-sustaining local community in which each one of us can thrive. I'm thrilled to see that the council is voting on a $15 minimum wage resolution tonight and to see the resolution vote and the ordinance as two important choices that are closely connected. Passing the ordinance and the resolution tonight will make an important, important statement about who we want to be as a community and about who we, how we want to approach the challenges we face. I also think, and I agree, that these votes are only the beginning. I know there's been some talk about having open conversations in alternative formats and spaces. Um, and while I believe our discussion of the cameras has been thorough and exhaustive here in City Council, and that creating a second process like the one proposed at the last meeting would be unnecessary on that issue, I would love to continue to engage in some shared and open conversations about what might be underneath the surface of this camera question. Specifically, I would like to see how we might channel this energy that's emerged from all sides of this discussion into a collective vision on, of a future that is safe, just, and prosperous for all. So I urge you to vote yes on the camera ordinance and the minimum wage resolution tonight. And I thank you so much for your time, your attention, and your thoughtfulness throughout this process. Thank you very much. Uh, Shireen Smith? <coughs> Hi, my name is Shireen Smith. I live at 119 Meadow Street in Florence. So I'm a second year social work student at the Smith School for Social Work. Uh, last year I worked with the Northampton Police Department to develop a jail diversion program for those in the community with mental health related issues. Not many know this, but the Northampton PD has a crisis intervention team training available to officers to train them in how to identify and work with people who may be in crisis. As to date, over 60% of the Northampton police force is trained, one of the highest rates in the state. During the seven months I was there, part of the work I did was collaborating with CIT trained officers 
to develop an outreach program to assist people post-crisis to get them access to necessary resources in the community. <coughs> this would include mental health treatment, housing, recovery services <clears throat> for substance use, hospitalization or respite options, and more. This team is still operating today, still doing work in the community, most notably with people downtown. I'm incredibly proud of this team and all the work they've done helping people in Northampton. During my time there, I met many officers who were committed to getting to know people beyond their reported crimes or mental health diagnoses or addiction issues. Officers who were committed to helping people in their community. This is why I was disappointed to hear about the proposal to impose cameras downtown. The amount of money that would be spent on cameras could go to increasing initiatives like the CIT outreach team, initiatives that help people gain access to basic living needs, mental health services, supportive community, and more. I believe fundamentally that we should be building relationships with people in our communities and supporting them, not watching and criminalizing them. This is a big reason why I'm setting to be a social worker, why I helped develop this project with the Northampton police in the first place. This is why I hope that today, you will vote for the ordinance that would eliminate the installation of cameras in Northampton. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jamie Webb. <coughs> Hi, um, my name is Jamie Webb. I live at 19 Perkins Ave. I've um, been a resident of Northampton for um, a little over eight years. Um, I have a master's degree in regional planning and work in um, a neighboring community in city, gov city government. Um, I know from my education and experience that surveillance does not reduce crime, it does not make people safer, and it does not create the welcoming community atmosphere that we want in our downtowns. So I urge you to see the, I urge you to support the ordinance prohibiting permanent high definition police surveillance cameras um, and also the $15 uh, living wage. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> um, that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's all I have signed up. Uh, hands up. Okay. All right. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to start from left, move towards the right of the room. Okay. You're first, sir. Uh, hi, my name is Reed, uh, Reed Arhood. Um, I live at 35 Clark Street in Ward 6 uh, in Florence. Um, I really appreciate the thoughtful dialogue that we've maintained throughout this entire process. Uh, but the very fact that we have to have this conversation right now deeply troubles me and speaks to a much greater problem with the government in our country. Northampton has long uh, has been a longtime haven for people from various walks of life, and now it is a sanctuary city. It's deeply troubling to me that we would even consider an action that puts the interest of a few above the interest of many citizens, especially when this action is a thinly veiled attempt to completely disappear one, if not the most marginalized segment of our population. To use our tax dollars in this manner would be an outrage, to say the least. Why don't we use our valuable tax dollars to fund more community programming, encourage and build trusting relationships between community members, rather than encourage our community members to fear each other? I urge you to continue to support the ordinance restricting the use of surveillance camera downtown. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll see. Uh, hands up, hands up. In the back, Mr. Councilor Newman, you're next. Good evening. My name is Bill Newman. I live in Northampton. I have the last 40 years approximately. I've worked downtown in Northampton for the last 40 years, and I'm a building owner with two partners in downtown Northampton. <clears throat> and I wasn't looking for two extra seconds, but, and I won't use them. Um, I'd like to put to rest a couple of things that have come up this evening, if I might. First, the proposed ordinance is consistent with the city charter. The council has the authority to pass it, and the city solicitor has said so. So that, uh, 
that argument, I think, can be put to rest. Second, there's a question about safety that's been raised. And I think it should be clear what's been proposed by the police is surveillance of the main intersection in Northampton, maybe one other intersection, so that when it comes to surveillance somehow of what is perceived by some to be objectionable behavior or crime, which at best would be moved somewhere else, these cameras aren't going to get any of that. You're not going to secure any of those images. As a law enforcement investigative tool, at best, these can, at most, these cameras are of limited utility. And as a surveillance, and in contrast, as a surveillance tool, they're really effective. So surveillance gets a big boost by this, and any kind of safety gets next to nothing. Third, I'd like to point out, because I think there's some misunderstanding about the ordinance itself, which is a very modest proposal. What it says, in effect, is that before there can be more surveillance cameras downtown, there has to be a public discussion and a vote by this council. That's a policy issue. This is a matter of such significance that before this happens, or, or should happen in the future, the council should vote on it. And I think that's right. The council should vote on it. It's not a ban for all time by any stretch of the imagination. It simply says there has to be a public discussion. There has to be the affirmative action of the legislative body of this city. And that's right. That is democracy. And then I'd like to make one final point, if I might. And this was the point that I made primarily in my last piece, my last op-ed piece in the Gazette. And that is that this past year, as the director of the Western Massachusetts Office of the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts, we began the Immigrant Protection Project. And we work every day to try to ameliorate the consequences of a horrifying and brutal immigration system. That's our work. We do that every day. And for people to say to us, no, we want to take surveillance cameras and make them available to ICE, and we'll do it any time they ask, and we may just do it as a matter of course, and to make Northampton that unwelcoming, that divided, that segregated, I think that's just wrong. I do think that's a moral issue. I urge you, please, to pass this ordinance again. Thank you very much. Uh, who else do we have? Uh, sorry. Right up here in the front. Hi, my name is Tyler Shaneman. I'm at One Valley Street. I wasn't planning on speaking today, so I'm a little nervous and I might um, go in different directions. I wanted to speak today because I've spent about two years of my life living under authoritarian governments. Uh, I'm a student of Middle Eastern politics. I teach it at UMass. And I study how authoritarianism functions. Uh, in the six months that I spent in Syria, one of the most heavily surveilled countries on this planet, I learned very quickly that surveillance does not prevent people from doing what they want to do. So using surveillance to siphon political um, discussions or actions does not work. People find private places to do what they want. Using surveillance to prevent Crime is not going to prevent crime, it's just going to move crime to a different place so they can do it anyways. It's not going to have that effect. What surveillance does do very well is it makes people feel like they are being watched. It creeps you out. It makes you behave as if you wouldn't otherwise behave. For the same reason that I like to sing when I'm in the car but not in front of other people because I know nobody's listening, or the sense of relief and liberation that I felt when I came home from living under authoritarian countries, and I came back to Northampton, and I just felt comfortable <coughs> being in public because nobody really cared what I was doing because I was just sitting there. And honestly, in, in these other countries that I was living in, nobody was probably paying attention to me anyways. I probably wasn't that interesting to them. But the mere fact that I felt like they could be watching made me feel really significantly uncomfortable. It made me behave as if I wouldn't have. And I don't want Northampton to become a place like that. And this is for somebody who I'm very privileged and protected. Like I'm not, I'm, I'm documented, I'm a citizen, I don't have anything to worry about. And even then I can see how this would really creep me out. It wouldn't make me want to, it would make me not want to live in Northampton anymore. And I can't imagine what it would be like to somebody in a much more vulnerable position. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hands up please. Pam. 
You're next. Hi, my name is Pam Hanna. I live at 11 Church Street in Northampton. And I was uh, previously an elected official. Uh, I was elected to the school committee and I served one term. And I want to say that um, as an elected official in a representative democracy, um, we elect you to use your minds, your thinking, your beliefs to, be, to govern us. Um, we don't, it's not a uh, popularity contest, so if there were 50 calls that wanted late start to end and 100 calls that supported late start, I was called on to use my mind and my understanding and my thinking to make a decision. And I would take input, as I know you take input from all the constituents, um, but at the end of the day, if people didn't like what it was that I was saying or how I was voting, they had the right to vote me out of office, which they didn't do. I just chose not to participate <laughs> anymore. Um, so in terms of the surveillance cameras, I don't really have much prepared to say. I was sort of tempted to pull out my phone and videotape people, particularly those who are in support of the cameras, to see how that made them feel. That seems a little bit ridiculous. There's something about this process that seems really familiar to me. And I go back to the panhandling ordinance, which was probably like eight or nine years ago, where we filled the room. And the questions, the questions that kept coming up are, why are we penalizing poor people? Why are we penalizing the poor people who are coming to our city um, you know, to, to live their lives in the best way that they can? Why are we singling them out? And that's what will happen. That's what, who, will be, who, will, who will be most impacted by these surveillance cameras. And you know, I applaud the police department for wanting to solve crime. Right? That's an honorable thing. They want to solve crime. Well, how about the crime of poverty? How about the crime of racism? How about the crime of economic injustice? Um, how about the crime of, of living under this you know, uh, terrorist regime that we're kind of living under in this country? These are really hard problems to solve. Nobody's got these figured out. It's really hard to live amongst one another and videotaping us and watching us is certainly not going to make it any better. So I applaud you, I support you, um, and I say absolutely we need to limit surveillance cameras. We need to not have surveillance cameras, really, if you want to know my opinion. Um, that's where it is. And so I completely support you in voting yes um, to this ordinance. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, yes, right here in the front. Yep. <coughs> Um, my name is Kira. I live on Union Street in Northampton. Um, a few days ago, we passed the anniversary of the death of Fred Hampton, um, who was a Black Panther. Uh, Fred Hampton was murdered uh, while he was sleeping in his bed with his pregnant wife by the FBI um, because he was a Black Panther. And I want to bring this up because I think it was like last month, the FBI named Black identity extremists as a terrorist threat to this country. Um, um, including like Black Lives Matter activists, et cetera. Um, I'm sure we can think through the implications of subjecting our local activists to surveillance by um, the FBI in light of that recent decision that was made. Most of the discussion of crime initiated by Jody Casper has been used, uh, has been, has used thinly veiled racism and classism to provoke middle class anxieties about the poor and the homeless who dare to exist in public spaces in Northampton. I'm reminded of an incident on January 13th of last year when a homeless man was given 10 days of jail time for shoplifting a $7 can of cashews from the CVS on Main Street. The homeless man in question told the responding officer that he was hungry and went inside to get some food. Um, are these the, the property crimes that Casper thinks we will eliminate by spending upwards of $70,000 on surveillance equipment? building elaborate infrastructure to help the police department further criminalize the poor, the hungry, and the homeless is not a solution to petty theft. The solution looks more like redistributing resources to ensure that people's basic survival needs are met and closing the gap between the wealthy and the poor in our city. 
why not invest this money in public health services, food pantries, affordable housing, medical care, addiction recovery, or res resources for domestic abuse survivors for a start? Um, furthermore, I want to thank Casper for bringing up theft because it creates an opportunity to discuss the most egregious form of theft happening every day in Northampton, wage theft. Uh, I want to thank Will Myers, who I think is in the room, for writing about this, and I'm going to quote him since I have a minute left. In his recent article, which I urge you to read, he writes, a 2016 study conducted between March 2014 and 2016 by the Pioneer Valley Workers Center and UMass Labor Center found that 65% of 235 workers who were surveyed in Northampton weren't paid overtime. That's 153 people whose wages had been stolen. Um, additionally, 22% of respondents worked off the clock, more than 75% didn't make a living wage, and as many as 95% don't get paid sick leave. Um, almost a quarter of them experienced sexual harassment and or discrimination due to their race or immigration status. Some experienced both. In my vision for a safer and more vibrant Northampton as a worker and a resident, uh, I imagine the city taking the $70,000 that they'd like to invest in mass surveillance and donating it directly to the Pioneer Valley Workers Center as a way to directly intervene in wage theft as well as racial discrimination, sexual harassment, and the abuse of undocumented community members in their workplaces. And I have seven seconds left. Thank you for voting yes last time. Please vote yes again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes in the back. That's you. Hello, my name is Grace Banish. I'm not from Northampton. I'm from Shutesbury, Massachusetts. I wasn't planning to speak today, but I heard a couple things that I felt like I really needed to speak to. First of all, I am really, I've lived in this community my whole life. I'm really disappointed that as a community, we have not outgrown criminalizing addiction. Um, we do a pretty good job in this community with our young people. But there are always kids who are vulnerable, who are neglected, who fall off the edge of the map. And when I was in middle school, in high school, when my friends stopped coming to school, when I knew they'd been kicked out by their parents, when no one could find them, no one had heard from them, I could find them in front of Haymarket. I could go in Amherst, I could find them outside of Rayos. These public spaces where young people who are vulnerable, who have a real problem with authority, these spaces, kids need spaces where they feel safe. These are the kinds of public spaces where kids who were in trouble could go and feel safe. I also had some friends who, and I haven't discussed this with any of the people involved, so I'm not gonna go into details, for whatever reason, stopped feeling safe in those spaces. When that happens, those kids move out into the woods and it gets a lot worse. Mm -hmm. Part of why I'm speaking right now is I live in Shutesbury. People have talked about how cameras and surveillance, it doesn't stop crime, it doesn't stop addiction, it just moves it around. I'm, I live in one of the towns where that moves to. We don't have the resources of towns like Northampton. We can't find people when we're in, they're in trouble. We don't see them when they're in trouble. They just disappear. Please vote yes on this ordinance. Please, we need safety. Thank you very much. Um, hands up, please. Um, right there, blue check shirt. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Amit Edge, and I live on Summer Street here in Northampton. Um, I'm here to speak against the idea of the city installing the surveillance cameras downtown. Uh, I moved to Northampton about five and a half years ago. Um, I like Northampton very much. It's a cool place, it's welcoming, it's supportive. Um, it has a growing diversity uh, that I appreciate um, from <clears throat> residents uh, to those who come for dining and shopping. I dig the whole thing, I like it a lot. Um, <laughs> I love living here. I never feel unsafe when I'm downtown. I'm able to walk around downtown at the morning, during the noon and at night, and happily go about whatever I'm doing almost without a care in the world. I'm able to do so because for all intents and purposes, <coughs> I'm viewed as a straight white guy. Uh, no one finds me threatening, no one's looking at me and staring at me. This affords me a privilege that I didn't do anything to earn. Uh, I can in no certain terms fully understand what life is like for people who come from uh, marginalized communities. <clears throat> the least I can do is to recognize this unfair dynamic 
and come before you today to voice my support for my fellow Northampton residents, our visitors, those who work here, and the issues these surveillance cameras create, uh, which many people have called attention to over the last few months. Cameras might not seem like a big deal through the privilege lens, uh, but if you take a step aside and think about how others are impacted by this, you can clearly see that cameras are a big deal, that they could be a big deal, especially if agencies could get access to that data. When I tell people I live in Northampton, a comment I often hear is what a nice place it is. I feel fortunate that I live here. I feel fortunate that when I am walking around with my partner as a gay man, I never hesitate to hold his hand. <clears throat> this wasn't the case where I moved from. I feel fortunate for the great community I found here. I am all for city leadership trying to improve safety efforts that work for everyone. I appreciate the respectful discussion that has been had on this particular issue. I don't think you would find this in many other places. What I would like to stress, though, is that everyone should have the same experience here in Northampton that I do. Enjoy Northampton without worry. No one should have to feel unwelcomed. No one should have to worry that a chance catch on a surveillance camera could lead to their family being separated. I worry that if these cameras were to be installed, the moment that happens, the Northampton we all know starts to fade away. The Northampton you are trying to protect won't be there anymore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hands up, hands up. Uh, right here in the sweater. Yep. Hi. Hi, good, uh, good evening. My name is Julio Capo Jr. and I live on Summer Street here in Northampton. Um, I too wanna just express my appreciation um, for your time and for, I know how much work and energy has gone into this entire process. Um, and it's a sign of, I think, of your, your invested uh, commitment to building bridges in this community. So thank you for all this. Um, tonight, I want to urge you all to vote yes in the surveillance ordinance and urge a vote um, on a $15 minimum wage. Um, I speak tonight as a property owner in Northampton, a history professor at UMass, and a former member of the Northampton Human Rights Commission. Um, I served in the latter post, uh, which has had the approval of, of Mayor Narkowitz for nearly two years. Um, in my capacity in that position, I learned more about the stories of people who are syst uh, systemically um, and systematically, excuse me, excluded, um, whose voices are not heard or pushed aside. And in that capacity then, and in my capacity as a historian who's studying this um, you know, over a great space of time um, and place, um, I, try to, I always try to seek these plat the, to use the platforms that I'm given um, to help me amplify the voices of those most vulnerable um, and those who are, not reg who are regularly silenced. Um, I moved here five years ago for my job, um, and my partner moved here with me. Um, in, in the kind of broadest of terms, we need to foster and welcome more cultural richness, not pass more barriers and hurdles and tools of violence that will divide and exclude those most marginalized. Um, surveillance promotes uniformity um, because it is inherently about control. This comes at the expense of creativity and the energetic lifeblood that makes a city like Northampton so special. We will mourn these losses, I promise you, of the artists and street wanderers and all those who represent new and diverse opinions that are necessary for this uh, community to continue to thrive. The only kind of surveillance that we need is to surveil and remain vigilant of those who want to strengthen the surveillance state and its powers. I want to make some brief statements about the increasing transformation of public spaces into private spaces. And the installation of cameras does just that. Um, in effect, it further expands and blurs the lines of public space and private space. The encroaching of these spaces have historically been used to criminalize, to police, and ultimately endanger and subject marginalized community, especially communities of color. We don't need surveillance. We need a welcoming, a welcome mat. It's good for our community, it's good for our local business, and it's good for Northampton. Um, I'll end very briefly here how we have community standards already and communal ways of crime prevention and safety. In 1961, in response to deurbanization, um, and white flight and fear of people of color and queer folks and many other reasons, one of the most important voices in urban history and urban studies, Jane Jacobs, suggested um, that cosmopolitan spaces and eyes on the streets is the most effective way. We have that and we don't need anything else. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh...
Yes. Uh, w yep. Hi, uh, my name is Jack Laxon. I uh, live in Amherst, Massachusetts, uh, over on High Street. <clears throat> um, I think one of the most important things that the council has touched on in the resolution um, on uh, cameras uh, is actually one of the more overlooked sections, uh, the mention of cell tower simulators. Now, if you're unfamiliar with these, these are devices that can pretend to be a cell phone network like Verizon or whatever, and you can, and your phone will automatically connect to these. These are a total information system that takes up everyone's phone information, no matter what. No matter if this case is a small case, a drug case, whatever it is, if they put that in Northampton, every single person's phone will be tracked. And you can't even tell what's going on with your phone. These devices have been known to interfere with 911 calls, interfere with other emergency systems, and are grossly unregulated. Uh, the, the company that these are bought from calls them Stingrays. They are highly, they are highly restrictive about the information about these purchase agreements. Um, and I think it's well, and I think it's worth pointing out that the Northampton Police Department has had issues in the past of responding to freedom of information requests, particularly recent uh, incident where something was requested in 2013 and we didn't see a response publicly until 2016. And it required over 100 emails back and forth to actually get something. You can look that one up on Muckrock. It's about the uh, inventory of the police department. And I think it's pretty clear that the city council needs to put forward who actually controls the police. If, this, if they don't answer to a civil elected body, who are they answering to? And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see as we move across the room, then we'll... Oh, now we have hands popping up over here again. Okay. Uh, Will, you're next. And then... Uh, my name is Will Meyer. I live on River Drive in Hadley. Um, I wanted to quickly speak to the idea that the uh, people have suggested that you know the process has moved too quickly or, or it hasn't been, been been fair. And I wanted to to speak to the um, to the to the fact that a lot of this uh, process has happened behind closed doors and not here in the council chamber, but uh, the. Back in May, uh, the chief of police, Jody Casper, met with the Downtown Northampton Association about, um, about their concerns about theft and shoplifting. Um, and in the, in the Mass Live, it said you know, they didn't talk about you know, public safety. But I wanted to, 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 to note that in order to be part of the Downtown Northampton um, Association, you have to pay thousands upon thousands of dollars um, in order to, to join that association, and the and most people in the public, working people, people who who don't have the time or resources to, to jo join an association like that, have Casper's ear. So when Casper then brought the proposal to the community, the first justification um, she brought after terrorism was shoplifting and theft, even though other types of crimes have gone up, where those types of crimes have gone down. Um, so. Um, to, to anyone who says that the, the process has been unfair, the people uh, with money got to meet with the chief of police and t to make their concerns known to her and to influence her proposal to the rest of the community, which didn't come till four months later. Um, so, yeah, I think, think, yeah, the process has been unfair. Thank you. Um, yes, Jeff. My name is Al Griggs. I live at Nine Barrett Place, and I also <laughs> want to comment about the process. I, I think that having attended the last two city council meetings, I've heard both sides of the issue about cameras. I happen to be in favor of surveillance cameras. 
But I wish that we'd had these conversations six months ago before the city council took its initial position on this, on this matter. I think that going forward, if we can learn from this experience of, of making quick decisions without getting the input that we've had tonight, I've learned a great deal from people who have a different point of view than I do. We would all make better decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes. And then we'll get back to the side of the room. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Salaka, and I live at Randolph Place Condos. I'm a small business owner, and I want this city to be prosperous, and I want it to succeed. I am a property owner. I want my property value to go up. Why not? <laughs> I'm a mother. I want this to be a safe place. I have a teenager who is wandering around Main Street doing whatever he does, and I want it to be a safe place. However, despite all, I love cameras too. I'm a photographer. <laughs> However, <laughs> I love cameras. However, I don't want uh, cameras all around Northampton. I oppose this, even though demographically I may be someone who might benefit from it. I don't think I will for all the reasons that everyone has said tonight. I thank everyone who spoke in support of the ordinance, and I just wanted to just use a couple seconds. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> um, on this side of the room, there were a couple of hands. Are they still there? Yep. Hello, I'm Paige Hendry Bodnar. I live on Clark Ave in Northampton, and I am still against the cameras. And I want to thank you for voting for the ordinance last week. I hope that you will do it again, and again, and again. Um, and also, I support the $15 minimum wage and no nukes. And thank you to everyone who. <laughs> Gave brilliant, beautiful testimony. I love this town, and I do not want cameras here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Hello. Uh, Emma Roderick, I live at 8 West Street, Northampton. Um, hobbled here tonight with a sprained ankle uh, to say again that I think that we should vote for the ordinance. Um, I thank everyone who gave beautiful testimony tonight. I just want to say I've learned a lot by participating in this extremely democratic process um, over a fairly long period of time. And I think <coughs> that um, I found it interesting to read uh, people writing about how uncivil it is when that has not been my experience and um, my experience of it. And I also think that there's a way that um, people have been talking about us needing to agree as if that like automatically means better policy. And I want to say that in democracy, we can welcome disagreement. And that's OK. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Hi, I'm Jennifer Frank. I live on Clark Avenue in Northampton. Um, I am also a history professor at UMass, and my area of expertise is the history of surveillance and policing and immigration. Um, so I just want to underscore that the fact that Northampton is a sanctuary city is really meaningful to a lot of us, both here in Northampton and elsewhere in the Valley. When I'm not at UMass, I actually teach English to speakers of other languages, which includes the refugees who've been resettled in Northampton over there at the Unitarian Church. I also serve in the ESOL program at the Jones Library in Amherst. All of my students are refugees and political asylees. Now, they don't have the courage to come to a city council meeting. They didn't ask me to speak for them, but I want you to hear me that there are a lot of people in this valley who will be really detrimentally affected by the installation of police surveillance cameras in Northampton. These are people who are cleaning your house, who work at the Hotel Northampton, who are washing dishes and serving um, at tables in the restaurants throughout downtown. So this would really alienate some of your constituents, and they're not going to be able to show up here and tell you that. There are also a lot of us who are documented who really value the sanctuary city status of Northampton. And to those who have said that perhaps the evidence I 
I have presented has sounded paranoid, I would respond that you're being naive. You cannot roll back the surveillance state once it gets started. Once the word gets out there that Northampton is surveilling everyone downtown, progressive people like me are going to stop coming here. There's not going to be an organized boycott. There's just going to be an attrition. People are not going to want to spend their money in a place that doesn't represent their political values. And we're the kind of people who live in Northampton. Now, I don't own property, but I think that my voice matters too. And I'm here to thank you for this process, which has gone on for three months, an entire semester. <laughs> One can learn a lot in an entire semester. So I thank you for listening, for hearing me, for, ex uh, for respecting my expertise, because I think I'm owed that, and Northampton's the kind of place where expert women are listened to. So please vote yes on this ordinance and yes on the $15 minimum wage, because that's who Northampton is and has been since 1850 when it said we're not going to enforce the fugitive slave law. That's what surveillance cameras are going to be in the 21st century. So let's uphold this 200 plus year tradition of Northampton as a surveillance <coughs> for black people running away from slavery, from queer people who are seeking some kind of sanctuary and safety in a really unsafe world, and for our refugees and asylees who have come here to really embrace the promise of America and the promise of Paradise City. So please vote yes on both, and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else? I'll be super quick. I'll even jog. And I promise I won't use any curse words this time. <laughs> My name is Eddie Haugen. I live at 256 Brookside Circle in Florence. And you, I'm your constituent. Just yours. <laughs> I'm yours. Um, Everything everyone said tonight, again, of course, I've been thinking in the back about if I disagreed, if I agreed with cameras and surveillance, as someone said back there, I agree with surveillance. I like it. It's good. Um, if, uh, anyway, if I believed in it, how would I argue against what people are saying in it? You know, there's no real argument to what people are saying. They're presenting their feelings. They're presenting facts. Um, and... I guess I would just not listen to them. That would be the way I would deal with it. So I would just say, I know, Councillor Labarge, you've been very, 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 very attentive during these very long nights, these very uh, long months that this has been going on. And I appreciate that. Um, not tuned us out, so to speak. Um, I have two children. I own property in Florence. I have two children in the public school system. I intend to keep them there all the way through. One who will be uh, there until she's about 22. Um, when she transitions out from, uh, she has a disability, and I expect her to get excellent services and care in the Northampton public schools. These are all things I feel very serious and very passionate about, so I swear I won't swear. Um, uh, you know, essentially, the process is, is happening in front of you. I, I disagree to some degree with the, someone who spoke tonight and said, you know, this is what Northampton is, this is what Northampton represents, because it does represent those things and those people and those feelings and those ideas, but it also represents the people who don't give a care about the people downtown and think they're kind of a menace. So Northampton represents those people too, as do you all out here, which we appreciate. Um, the point being, really, it's sort of like, how do you police your town? That's it. It's like, do we have one camera here, or do we have a thousand cameras? You know, are we lazy? Do we hit the streets and you know, beat the bushes to find these, you know, people? But it also depends on what you define crime as, right? I mean, if your crime is, say, sex workers giving massages on a downtown street. Right? And then you're going to go in there and get them out of there and all poo poo that. You know, maybe that's your thing. You're not into that. Enjoying this so far? I've got 19 seconds left. Please vote yes on the, uh, on the ordinance. Um, and please keep using your minds. I mean, I've tried to tune into each of your minds during this process. And some things are just, it's beautiful. I can't even imagine what's going on in there. It's beautiful. <laughs> and some people I just hear like a steady hum. And those are the people that disagree. And that's fair and that's okay. 
but the steady hum, you know, try to see through it and vote yes. Thank you, thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Um, I will ask the administrative assistant to call the roll. We will go, hopefully, it will determine our form going to the meeting, at which point we start to talk. And you're welcome to stay. Uh, you're invited to stay and watch us deliberate. Here. Present. Here. Here. Present. Here. 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 We do have a quorum, therefore we are convened. Um, there are no public hearings scheduled that I know of. And uh, recognition one minute announcements from councilors. Councilors? Anything? Councilor Nash? Uh, real quick, the uh, Bridge Street School walking school bus is going to be in effect for the North Street, uh, the northern route. Uh, it starts over on Crosby and heads over to the school. It starts at 8.05 in the morning. It's supervised. I'm usually on the route as well as uh, Howard Moore, uh, uh, the school committee rep for Ward 3, and, along with a number of other parents. And we're, we're trying this out until uh, uh, the holidays to see if we can get this going. So if anybody's interested, um, uh, both in volunteering uh, reach out to the PTO page and if you know of any kids in the neighborhood who want to take advantage and, uh, and families who want to take advantage of uh, the school bus let us know thank you anyone else uh, Councilor Bidwell and then Councilor Klein uh, yes this is an announcement of a meeting not not in Northampton but uh, <coughs> it's Monday night uh, at 7 p.m. at the Mount Toby Friends meeting house in Leverett some of you may have been paying attention to the hands across the hills process by which folks in Leverett reached out to folks in Kentucky to come together and bridge divides, uh, find common communication. Um, this meeting is to, uh, it says, what we learned from our weekend with our Kentucky guests. And I know some of us are going to be there because we want to start to learn a little bit more about how uh, conversations and dialogue can be structured so as to bridge across divides and I think what we've all learned is that you don't have to go to Kentucky to find uh, divides that need uh, or that would benefit from a little bridging so uh, there is some talk about bringing some of these lessons uh, back to Northampton for some kind of community forum but I'd encourage folks to uh, if interested attend this meeting in Leverett on Monday night. Council Klein. Um, I mentioned this at the last meeting, but I wanted to uh, say it again because it's coming up on Sunday. Northampton's Human Rights Commission is going to be celebrating the 69th anniversary of um, the day the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Dec Declaration of Human Rights. Um, on Sunday, December 10th, this coming Sunday, on the steps of City Hall at 2 o'clock, there will be an event to launch um, the Human Rights Commission's campaign supporting human dignity and civility in Northampton. Um, and there will be pledges to sign um, saying that you will not tolerate acts of hate and hateful, ang hateful language. Um, and the entire community is invited and counselors are very much invited to be there. Anyone else? Councilor Barch. Yes. Um, this Sunday, 11.30 a.m., at the Senior Services on Con Street in Northampton is their holiday dinner. Um, you would have to call Senior Services to see if they've sold out or not, but they usually do every year. And that's at 11.30 this Sunday. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Um, uh, the mayor's not here for proclamations. I don't think so. There's none queued up. So we come and move right into resolutions. And um, and actually, before we do that, um, I, I'm just going to ask the council if they're prepared to move clearly the item that garnered the most attention. And uh, I make comment. that motion. Move that up. At, we'll do that after the resolution. Is everyone okay with that? The surveillance ordinance. Okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me. First up, we have this is um, see, boop, 
resolution in support of a $15 minimum wage with, um, and as it quickly loads up, there we go. This is upon the recommendation of Councilors Ryan R. O'Donnell and Maureen T. Carney. Uh, this is, as I said, a resolution in support of a $15 minimum wage in Massachusetts. And whereas Northampton's local economy depends on many low-wage hourly workers who are struggling to meet their basic needs, including many restaurant workers earning less than the full minimum wage, and whereas the minimum rent in Northampton is about $975 monthly, or $11,700 annually, which is over 50% of the $22,880 uh, annual income of a full-time worker. And whereas due to legislation enacted in 2014, the state minimum wage rose from $8 to 11 by 2017 in annual dollar increases. <clears throat> Excuse me. And whereas New York and California, as well as cities such as Seattle and Washington, D.C., have recently enacted plans to raise the minimum wage to $15. And whereas the sub-minimum wage for tipped workers is currently $3.75 an hour in Massachusetts. And <clears throat> whereas... California, Minnesota, and Maine have eliminated the sub-minimum wage for tipped workers and make it equal to the minimum wage. And whereas Northampton adopted a fair minimum wage ordinance, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, Section 5-6 of the Code of Ordinances that requires employees of the city's legislative and executive branches to be paid at <coughs> least the state minimum wage, and whereas in Massachusetts the House Bill 2365 and Senate Bill one. 004 would raise the state minimum wage by a dollar a year over five years until it reached $15, after which it would be automatically adjusted to rise with the cost of living increases. And whereas these bills would also increase the sub-minimum wage over a period of eight years until it matched the minimum wage. And whereas in the Northampton area, the Massachusetts Budget and Policy Center estimated estimates that 30 percent of wage earners, or 19,517 people, would benefit from increasing the minimum wage to $15 by 2022. And whereas raising the minimum wage boosts the local economy by giving low wage workers more take home pay to spend locally. Now therefore be it resolved that the city council supports an incremental increase of the minimum wage to $15 and indexing the minimum wage to future increases in the cost of living. And be it further resolved that to accomplish this, the city council supports House Bill 2365 and Senate Bill 1. 004. And be it further resolved that the administrative assistant to the City Council shall, uh, I believe, submit a copy of this resolution to be, oh, shall cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, the Governor, the Co-Chairs of the Joint Committee on Labor and Workforce Development, the sponsors of House Bill 2365 and Senate Bill 1004, Representative Donahue and Senator Donnelly, as well as Representative Peter Cocott. I'll accept a motion. Second. Uh, motion's made and seconded. Discussion? Sponsors want to speak to this? Councilor Bidwell? I tried to get in, get my hand up first on the motion because I, I wanted to suggest that we refer this to, uh, to a committee, to a community resources committee. Ah, well, okay. You, and you, you stood sure. that even though it's been put on the floor. Okay. So you want to make a, you're. You well, no, I'll let, I'll let the sponsors speak to their. Okay. And, and, but, I, but I'd like to speak to okay. my thought about that. Sure. Um, sponsors? Sure. Councilor? Yeah. All right, Councilor Rodon. I'm happy to provide a, a brief introduction. Thank you for the chance to, to talk about this resolution. Um, and thank you to the public for uh, bringing it up in your comments tonight as well. When I think about this resolution, I sort of hear the echoes of some people throughout the city who say, oh no, not another resolution. Um, and I think that's a really good reason to pass this resolution. Because currently, if we want to raise the minimum wage um, federally, but certainly at the state level, the options uh, include a contentious legislative battle or an epic, expensive ballot measure. <coughs> and I sort of think that's a little bit absurd. I think that in our society, if, we'd have, if we make a decision to have a minimum wage, in other words, if we agree that people should make enough uh, to, to meet their basic needs, and um, Kitty Callaghan spoke pretty eloquently about the need for people to make a living wage, um, then we should do that. 
And the question of adjusting it based on inflation and cost of living adjustments, which, which happen annually no matter what, should be secondary. And one of the main things that I like about the proposal to, to increase minimum wage is actually to, inf uh, to uh, um, peg it to inflation after it's raised to 15. So if you don't like this resolution, support it, because there will ne never be another resolution uh, to raise minimum wage again. Um, Northampton is, an, is a fortunate community, but it's also, um, relatively speaking, an, an expensive one. And if you work a full-time job, you know, over 2,000 hours a, a year and you make a minimum wage, you're going to be paying over half of the money you earn in a year in, in housing. And I just think that is um, an economically uh, precarious situation for an individual and an economically perilous situation for a community because people can't save money that way. They can't get ahead. They can't deal with unforeseen circumstances in their lives. Uh, whether it's a medical expense or um, anything else. And we as a society suffer uh, both in terms of, both materially and, and spiritually, I would say. Um, so I appreciate the chance for, for the council to, to consider this. Um, when, the, the res when the minimum wage was raised previously, uh, and, and the last time was this year when it went up to $11, it went up very incrementally over three years by a dollar an hour. Um, I think, uh, well, not everyone would agree, but I think there, there is consensus um, among many that it was not an economic disaster. In fact, there were many uh, salutary effects, for not just for workers, but for local economies like Northampton, where local people having money to put into the local economy, um, <coughs> it produces very good effects uh, for the whole city um, and for, for the region. Um, you saw recently that those people working to get this on the ballot just finally got enough signatures. So it, it looks like it, it may be on the ballot, but I think that there is an advantage to making progress with legislation first. Um, there is actually a, a task force on retail issues um, that the, the state Senate has set up. And in fact, there was a local Northampton person serving on, on that, and that's Judy Harrell of Harrell's. Uh, so there's a legislative process, and I would suggest that there's value to the City Council lending our voice and sending this opinion to them because it can inform them as they do their work. Um, my opinion is, is pretty clear on this. I think people should be paid a living wage. Uh, I think that the idea of uh, businesses doing well and workers doing well are not incompatible ideas. To, um, some people do believe that. I don't. So my opinion is set, but I realize there's still debate to be had. I say let's send our opinion on this um, during during that debate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Carney? Um, well, uh, I guess I can speak to this briefly. I don't know whether, <clears throat> I'm assuming this may be uh, referred to our committee, um, which is fine. But uh, a couple of people spoke tonight. We heard from Kitty Callaghan and then also from Patty Healy. Um, one point that Kitty made was, you know, if we look at the living wage calculated at the present, that it's 1336, which is halfway to the $15 presently. So four years from now, five, or five years after, you know, uh, this legislation is en enacted, it's very likely that we would be, you know, uh, uh, again, since we, um, we only recently made that recalculation for the uh, living wage. And then as Patty Healy said, there's definitely a direct relationship between, you know, the, um, the decrease in union density and the number of, and, and the, also the failure of minimum wage to keep up with the cost of living and with uh, certainly any living wage. So for a number of reasons, um, uh, the timing is right, given that these two, uh, basically what the resolution does is says that we support the, the House and the Senate bills, and um, at the same, it makes no mention of the ballot question, but we don't, I mean, this is, this is moving forward. This fight for 15, as most people know, but is a national movement, and this is a, a chance for us to, to weigh in on something and um, forward that sentiment to our representatives at the State House. 
other counselors? Councilor Bidwell. Um, first, first of all, I, I, I want to say that I uh, totally agree with uh, the Kitty Callaghan's arguments. I've for a long time been a supporter of Fight for 15 nationally, and I'm pretty sure that I will vote for this uh, this resolution. I much prefer I would much prefer to see this addressed by the legislature than the referendum. But whichever way we get there, I think it's important. But the reason I would like to see this referred to committee is that I think one of the jobs of, 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 of this council in a situation like this is to at least take into consideration what, what might be the local impacts. Um, and I don't think in just immediately taking a vote on it, we've really had a chance to do that. Uh, I know I, I've, I've, perhaps I should have tuned in a little bit sooner, but I only realized on Monday that this was going to be on our agenda. And I would like to see an opportunity in committee to, to, to learn a little bit more about uh, from, from, from local folks who are, who are running businesses, from local, uh, from, from young workers, for example, who are worried that they might find themselves out of a job. I'm worried about some of the unintended consequences of this that, that Judy Harrell has spoken about and other, others have spoken about. That is, if, if over time we're paying 13 or 14 or 15 dollars to a teenager to scoop ice cream, uh, we may not do that. We may, it may be, make more sense to pay overtime to existing employees. I'd hate to see some of these entry level jobs for teenagers. Uh, be a victim of what is otherwise very, very smart social policy. So that's just an example of what I'd like to learn, learn more about and hear more about. Uh, there's been some talk about is there still an opportunity to amend the House and Senate legislation to include a second tier for, for teen workers, for example. Um, and I have no idea whether that's possible. But I think those are the kinds of things that I'd like to see a study a little more on the way to what I imagine will be an affirmative vote, but I would just like to like us to do our homework a little more in terms of uh, local impacts before immediately taking a vote on it. Uh, Council Dow? Um, at some point, I'd, before any action is taken either way, I'd like to offer some technical amendments to it. So just to ask. Okay. Put my foot in the door um, I, we do It's important that I remind ourselves that uh, this is our penultimate meeting for this term. Um, in this instance, a resolution is not, there's no, there's not a clock ticking other than the fact that there's, there's pending legislation that it's, a, it's hope or its ambition is to influence. Um, but depending on how we do this, we only have one other meeting we also will have not, we will not have committees formed even after our initial meeting in January, um, and probably in once we do our organizational meeting, we determine who the president is, and then the president has to figure out where everyone sits at the table, and, and which committees they're serving on. So it, 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 what I'm saying is, a referral will bump this, not the traditional length of time, but a little, more than a little longer, but. Not, I don't know if that matters, and I don't know what other sponsors feel about that. Councilor Carmen. Well, I know it's, um, uh, I mean, we have time for our community resources on December 20th, is it, Councilor? Um, or, or 18th, December 18th, and then our council meeting is the 21st. Um, I don't know if that would be sufficient time to devote the community resources <coughs> meeting. Well, I mean, devote time certainly then, if, if that's something Councillor, that you had in mind to to Councillor Bidwell. Yeah. Now, my only concern is we're actually talking about something that hasn't been put on the floor yet. So, if we we'll talk to the item or the agenda, or I'll accept a motion for referral. But um, I, would, I would make a motion to refer. Uh, <coughs> second to that. Second. Okay. So now, now it makes more sense. And it's, okay. Thanks. In order to avoid what uh, Councillor Dwight was talking about which mean the bump up the end of this council term. Um, we, have a, we have a community resources meeting scheduled for the, for the 18th and then a second uh, council, council meeting. I mean, it's possible that we could do, so if we wanted to keep this in this term, we could do a reading tonight. We could do 
and uh, have this on the council, have it, have it still be on the community resources agenda for the 18th and leave it open for a second reading, which leaves it alive and would al allow it to be handled within this term. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the, the referral would be in addition to a first reading or two readings if we're on, on the 21st if we wanted to try to you know, avoid the, the issues that come up with a new term. Uh, I, I have I have no interest in, in dragging this out. I just like, other than right here in real time, have an opportunity for a little further discussion of it. And I very much like the the idea, and it does sound like it would fit the calendar, of referring to a committee. And I, my apologies to the committee chair for having sprung this on on her, but it seemed to me like that would be the appropriate venue. And I my my own preference would be to refer it, have a committee discussion take two votes at our December meeting uh, so we can wrap it up in this session. As the person who second the uh, referral or works for me. Uh, discussion on the referral, Council O'Donnell. Well, I don't have discussion on the, on the referral. I have technical amendments to make before we refer. Before they're referred. I just think it would be good to refer a clean, <laughs> healthy version of it. Fair enough. Or I could simply, it I mean, be amended. it could be amended in committee too. I, I suppose, committee. but it just seems more. Okay. What, what's everyone's preference? I'm, I'm amenable to anything here, short of a slap fight. Councilor Nash. I just want to make sure that I'm following procedure because uh, I actually want to have a few questions about this, and I think it would be helpful to have those questions in the queue as if it goes out to committee, if it goes. Is, the, is now the time to say that? Well, if it, well, if it goes to committee, you're you're welcome to actually submit your letters to the committee, your opinions or questions, and they can be addressed in committee. You can actually attend the committee meeting as well. Uh, it's also announced as a full council meeting, so that you'd be allowed to ask those questions okay. there. Uh, would you like to hear them? <laughs> Do I? We could hear them. Well, actually, I want to. I want to. I want to stay. I want to. Stay, I, wanna, I wanna stay on track here because we are actually okay. now debating referral. Well, you know when. I'll, I'll send you a buzz. <laughs> Councilor Shara, did you have your hand up? No, but um, just I'm, I'm happy to hear the amendments now. And um, I don't believe there's anything else on the agenda for that community resources meeting, so we could devote that meeting to it. And I don't know if there are people that want to, you would like to have invited to talk on it, but um, we can work that out. Uh, let me ask permission of the proposers of the referral if you're prepared to hear from Councilor O'Donnell relative to amendments before uh, sending this off to committee if that indeed is the consequence of the vote. Sure, I would, I'd, I'd, I'd be. You're up for that. In, in, All right, Councilor O'Donnell. So we're like suspending the, the order. I'm suspending the, the, I'm suspending the vote okay. on the referral to okay. make an allowance for um, amended uh, your proposed amendments. Spending space and time to. I have that power. I, I'm in <laughs> awe of this. <laughs> it, it, it's not. All that complicated. Um, first, in the, in the first page, the penultimate, whereas um, we're speaking about four years instead of five. Um, I, I'd like to structure this in, in form of a motion, if I can. Just not technically, technically in order, but um, I'll do it anyway. Um, and finally, um, second, secondly, the second to last, be it further resolved, says that to accomplish this, the city council supports and then names the bills. Those bills, are, they're going to change. If you read them now, it says, for example, that the first increase in the minimum wage will go into effect in January of 2018, which is not going to happen. So I'd just like it to say the City Council supports legislation in the spirit of House bill, Senate bill. Okay, so you, yes. Uh, so after supports, yeah. you want to add in spirit of? Le legislation in the spirit of, yeah. Right. Legislation supports legislation in this spirit of. Yeah. And that's just so in committee, I don't get questions about, hey, this language doesn't make any sense. I, I acknowledge that the language of the bills are, is going to change. So. so that would be my request. Um, so that's actually a motion. So I'd like to second that motion. A second. Okay. Any, any discussion, further discussion on the motion of amendments? Councilor Nash, and now is not the question. Okay, did I write? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it was specifically around that 
that language right there. So that cleans that up for me. Thank you. Wow. Kill two birds. Uh, Councilor Shara. Can I make the Scrivener's that you caught? Or should we wait for a different motion? Um, yeah. We'll, Pause. Yeah. I think we could. Yes. Um, so, and the final resolve shall cause, right after shall, the word cause should be inserted. Any other amended language? Councilor Klein. Oh, no. I want to speak speaking, to the referral. We're, we're speaking to the amendments right now. Gotcha. I'll get you on referral. Gotcha. And then, okay. Any further discussion on the amendments? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Back to the referral. Councilor Klein. So you're done, right, <laughs> Okay. Um, I just wanted to. Um, kind of understand a little bit more about the referral. If we refer this um, because we need more information and we need to be able to kind of discuss this in a more in-depth manner, um, and I hear some concern about kind of carrying this over into the next year, um, I, I'm just not clear on in one meeting of the Community Resources Committee what we're going to be able to do. Um, that will give us much more information. I mean, other than assuming that each of us on the committee will go and do our own research and bring it back, um, you know, is there a way for us in one meeting to conduct the level of study that it sounds like, um, Councillor Bidwell, you're trying to get us to? So I just I wanted to think a little bit more about the the um, the potency, I guess, of carrying this forward. Councilor Bidwell, that was directed to you. Sure, I, 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 I don't have a detailed plan for what that committee would, 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 would con or committee meeting would consist of. <coughs> I'm pretty sure we'd at least know more after that than we, than, 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 than we do right now. And for example, we, we would have an opportunity to invite folks from uh, local immediately affected businesses to tell us what they, to tell us what they think. Uh, I don't know what the chamber's position, if it has one, or, or, the, or the DNA. Um, it'd be interesting to know whether technically it is still possible to address this question of a, of a, of a, of a, second, uh, of a second tier. Um, we at least know more about that having discussed it and having asked some expert, experts to come in than we know about it now. Uh, and I, I fully acknowledge we're not going to it's not going to be exhaustive, but, but it would be better than what we know now. Is, is so I mean. as follow-up to my question then, I guess, um, what would prevent us from doing that for our second reading, asking mm -hmm. some of those people to come in, maybe doing a presentation at a council meeting? I, I guess my own experience is that the committee meetings can be a little less formal, a little more conversational. Uh, in terms of back and forth and, and really getting to the bottom of, of, of matters than the formality of, of, a, of a meeting in this chamber. I think that's been my experience to date anyway. And then the last thing is just I would want to check with the chair and just really make sure that you feel like um, you have the wherewithal by the 18th to line the people up that would really be able to give us some of the, the thinking here. And I think I would really, what would be really important to me is to see people from a spectrum of you know supporters to questioners to people who have concerns about what this might mean for business to those who really support it so that we really have that robust discussion that will inform us um i i mean i'm not prepared to drop my own list but it wasn't it's not my request to to refer it um but if those who want it referred or if the committee will send me names of people that they think um they would like to hear from, I would be happy to invite them. Uh, Council LaBarge? She just you answered. All, you all set? Uh, anyone else? On the, uh, this is on the motion to refer. On the motion to refer, Council Murphy. Yeah. Um, as Councilor Bidwell said, we will certainly know more than we know now. There are jurisdictions that, are, that have passed this. There is experience to be learned for what's happened there. I particularly want to come and speak about the impact that we'll have on a small nonprofit that I'm involved with that's on a fixed income that will cause me to get rid of employees. So there are things that I'd like to speak about that are more appropriate in committee that, you know, than taking our time here. So that, that's why I seconded it, because it is my intent to go and, and offer some testimony. 
one speaker then. So you got one speaker to put in right now. Councilor Barch. Yes. Um, I have some concerns because when you're talking about businesses and so forth and the chamber again, there are many businesses locally on Main Street who do not belong to the chamber because of the high expense it costs and because some of these businesses pay an extremely high amount of money for rent, they can't afford to belong to the chamber. So how do we reach out to the business people? That's my question. We hear the chamber all the time, but it's just not the chamber. We have many, many people in business here in our city of Northampton who do not belong to it. So my question is, how do we reach to them? Well, at the risk of uh, outing a member of the Fourth Estate, it's possible there is an article that may be drafted, and hopefully people will see that there is an opportunity to <coughs> testify to this point. We, uh, the chamber is represented here also tonight. Um, the DNA, uh, there's cross-membership stuff too. Um, we don't have the means or uh, to actually transmit to every individual business and 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 I think to Councilor Klein's point it's not just businesses I mean we're talking about um, the spectrum of people impacted and affected by wages as they stand how we transmit that the hope is is that um, through media <coughs> social media word of mouth that people understand there's an opportunity to speak to this because okay, so. I have concerns I mean being down to the center of Northampton four times a week talking with some of the business owners I've already been told that they have great concerns that because of the high rent that they pay on the first floor right across the street over here that they don't know if they'd be able to afford their employees if there's an increase so well, I would, I would there, are, there are concerns and they don't belong to the chamber right well this is back to um, back to the referral but council I would uh, I would urge you to contact those folks that you've heard from and encourage them to participate in the discussion at the at the in committee if you have the opportunity to do that uh, any more discussion on the referral council client I guess I want to continue to um, try and I don't know explore this point I, I just wonder if we're not setting a precedent here with resolutions at this point um, you know, we've passed 15 resolutions over the last year. Yes, we have. And I think only one of them that had to do um, with our very contentious question about the cameras ended up going to committee. Um, and another, you know, 13 or 14 have not. And the material that's in them, and those of us that do our homework before a meeting, um, and we look into whatever the topic is that the resolution is about and we do our own research and we come ready to talk about it in, on the floor of council for two different meetings, first vote and second vote, bringing together the research and um, may, hopefully talking to constituents and hearing from constituents, hearing from public comment. Um, and that's how we make our decisions about resolutions. And I, I'm, I'm feeling some concern that because of content that people are suspicious of or uncomfortable with, there's some way in which we're slowing down the process and we're not doing the homework on our own that we need to do. Um, that said, I understand that it's important to hear from a, an array of voices, um, but I just wonder about the mechanisms by which we do it and slowing things down to me um, when I don't think they necessarily need to be slowed down, and it's, it might be because of a discomfort of one or two counselors, I'm, I'm just not sure if it makes sense. But I, I really am. I'm asking this as a question. I'm not. Um, well, if, I, if I could address that, the, the mechanism of subcommittees is set up precisely for that purpose, as, as if, there, if there are difficulties or there are counselors who need to suss out more or require more information or deeper research on an issue. That's why we have the subcommittees. It could, it can be employed as a strategy at times, but that's sort of the trade-off we make. But the fact is, is that it doesn't um, quash. So the, actually our charter set up to, so they, it's not 
it's only to expand conversations as opposed to quashing them. And in fact, actually, I would even, again, use the example you just cited about uh, the ordinance that we'll be addressing soon. The conversation expanded exponentially. Um, and I was initially resistant to the recommendation of referring to the resolution, but I actually come to realize that, that it had had unique and very powerful benefits. So, so I think in this instance, I think I mean, my my own, my personal only concern is trying to make this fit and not vote on something because of the fact that we do have a clock, uh, a municipal structural clock that's ticking, but. Fortunately, with a resolution that's not as um, critical, because actually we can leapfrog that resolution onto the new term. Also, given the fact that there are no new constituent members of the council, but so whatever knowledge that's gleaned in the course of that discussion, will hopefully, be retained two weeks later. Uh, although I, I couldn't test my own ability to retain anything at this point, but uh, Councilor Dow, um, thank you. Um, I, I take a lot of what Councilor Klein says to heart and I think she makes um, some very good points and I also want to make sure that we're treating you know content aside I, I want to make sure that resolutions are going through as they say in Congress not that Congress is our model <laughs> but as they say you know regular order um, I don't want to start creating special rules for you know certain things uh, so I think that's very important and so therefore um, I just like to clarify and, and this goes to what, some of the, what the council president was saying. I want to clarify our understanding that should this come back from community resources, um, that uh, well, we have a commitment to entertain two readings before the end of the year. Make sure just we understand that. Council Bidwell. Uh, well, as the proponent of, the, of this motion to refer, I absolutely support that. I, 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 I hope I made it clear. I have no interest in delaying this. I just want and we've come up with a solution that will still have it passed at the same meeting it would have been otherwise it's just with benefit of a committee meeting and having some of our questions addressed and answered in the meantime and I, and, and it's important to note and for the public to understand that actually our charter is structured uh, conscious of the way things are done in the state and federal level which is to actually sometimes condemn any bill to death by sending it to committee where it will die and not be seen again that's not allowed under our rules uh, everything has to be processed back out with the recommendation neutral or otherwise so that that is not a strategy for defeating any any act or ordinance or resolution so just so everyone can that. all right to the referral all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. and opposed abstentions okay all right so that's referred out and now we're back on to the resolution this is second reading this is the resolution to prevent nuclear war um i'll accept the motion put that on the floor second, second. okay it was that council labarge made the motion and then let's see council klein had the second uh discussion i think it's worth noting uh our health fan was not able to be here tonight because he's headed to oslo to be a participant in the receipt of the Nobel Peace Prize for their advocacy on this issue. Worth noting. Very cool. He lives here in this community. Um, I recently enjoyed another rare evening looking at social media and hearing some commentary about our, our the pomposity of council calling for the end of nuclear weapons. And I take issue with that, obviously. The fact is this was a citizen-generated resolution. It speaks directly to investments that we make and the priorities we make and the impact it has directly here to say nothing of the fact of the just expressing the hope and aspiration that we will not have to continue, all of us grew up in this, live under the shadow of nuclear devastation. And there was a time when we dared to hope and now it's not so hopeful and I think it's important to and reasonable to express our concern relative to this issue. And I think the vote reflected that at last time. Um, I'm not ever going to apologize personally for this resolution, certainly not on social media. But um, any other discussion on this? Okay. 
All those in favor of the resolution, second reading, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? It passes in second reading. Um, okay, so we're moving up, and this is, whoa, whoa, way, way down here. Um, way down here, where did it go? Um, do, do, do. What number, what letter? It's J. J, 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 there it is. There it is. So, this is item 17.397. This is an ordinance establishing restrictions on the use of surveillance technology in public spaces. Came with a neutral recommendation from legislative matters, and it's the second reading where it was approved. Um, I'll accept a motion, put it on the floor. Second. Motions made and, sec made and seconded. <laughs> Councilor O'Donnell, second. Discussion? I bet there is some. <laughs> uh, Councilor O'Donnell. It sounds like we're all pretty much on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've let off the introduction previously, so I actually prefer to let other councilors speak first, if that would be okay. okay. Someone else wish to speak to this issue? Uh, Councilor Carney. Thank you. Um, I want to thank everybody who has contacted me on this issue. Um, I did receive probably more communications in the last week um, than I had uh, from constituents and from other people, and I really appreciated the time that people took to um, really uh, clarify their concerns. Um, some folks did talk about process, and that was some of what I heard tonight and some of what was... was uh, you know, more recently posted in the in the paper, and you know, it's difficult for me to um, to completely understand that. Just because, um, I mean, as those of you who've been sitting here now for close to two and a half hours, <laughs> no, um, we have a very complicated process sometimes in city government, and um, sometimes the complaint is that things really do. Uh, drag on and on. And I know that it's only been a few months since this came to our attention. Um, but I was, made, I was made aware of the issue by a neighbor who first brought, you know, brought to my attention that the, you know, the police chief, she'd seen it on Facebook. It was a, you know, because we know the police department had actually posted on there. On the side of the, and, and very proactively, had reached out to the community to talk about this. I, I have all along credited uh, Chief Casper, the police department, for reaching out. Yeah, as somebody pointed out, yeah, um, you know, there was a wider community meeting after there had been an earlier meeting. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with the police chief meeting and talking with issues with the Downtown Northampton Association, any of that. Um, but you know, I I I guess um, the 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 charge that this was really rushed through really doesn't ring to me. Um, often we write things and bring the uh, councilor O'Donnell actually drafted the resolution tonight for the um, minimum wage and um, asked me to join him. You know, the two two councilors will meet or three councilors will meet and talk about something and bring it before, uh, that's the way we do it. We bring it before the full council, not before everyone at first, and not before the whole community at first. This is where things arrive into the, into the uh, public sphere, it's when they first come to the council. And so um, the charge that this was really a rushed through process didn't, hasn't real, even though I'm not one of the original sponsors, um, it's, I know that uh, that we did everything. This this council really did s sent to two committees, to city services and to legislative matters, both pieces of um, legislation, both the resolution and the ordinance. And as Councilor Klein had pointed out, you know, I mean that we don't often send resolutions to committee. 
Um, most of our resolutions come directly to the council and then are, are passed in, in subsequent readings. So um, the correspondences that I had from some folks who really thought that this had been rushed through, I did have to disagree and say that I, you know, I, I mean, we have had opportunities hours long at seven meetings. Actually, it's more than that because there's been at least five city council meetings, three committee meetings, and then the forum itself, which is about nine public meetings where we've had this discussed. And so even at two hours a piece, we're talking, we're pushing close to 20 hours of just hearing from, from constituents on this matter. So I'm comfortable um, <coughs> that I have heard from people on both sides of this issue, and I value the opinion of people on both sides. I, I really do value the concerns that people have about safety. I think that this is the wrong approach. I think that surveillance is the wrong way to address that. And we can still work. We have a working relationship with the police. I feel like we still, our committee, we meet with the police and the city services committee, and we'll have the opportunity to, to explore other opportunities for community policing, this was brought up. So given those things, I don't want to uh, take too much time here. I just want to say that I am still prepared to um, support this ordinance. And I have heard, and I want to thank everyone else, everyone who came forward tonight and every other night in the past. Thank you. Uh, Council LaBarge. Yes. Um, I have, and I've made out today of my feelings again on the second resolution on the reading. The chief has acknowledged that it is possible that public surveillance cameras may not deter crime. This means that it is possible it will be a complete waste of taxpayers' money, and that I do believe. We can't afford to risk unpopular program with no guarantee that the community will be safer with taxpayers' money. It's a waste. We are looking at 80000 or 100000 and that could change. I, but several associated hidden costs are lightly, are likely to make the price much higher. That I would like to hear from the chief and the mayor. At the first public hearing, the chief stated that she was in support of body cameras for police officers. But since her statement, there had been no request for funds for body cameras or any further discussion or body cameras. And a friend of mine that was at that meeting was an attorney and heard the same thing. The mayor has stated in the Gazette he does not support them. What is the City Hall's position on body cameras? That's my question. Does City Hall support it like Chief Casper does or doesn't she? Does she oppose it like the mayor does? Body cameras are better because instead of constant spying, they record only actual police interactions with people. They create more safety for police and the public with a much lesser level of intrusion and invasion of privacy. The chief says that public surveillance cameras are for public safety. When then did she scale the proposal down? Why did she propose the, and t I mean, why then did she scale the proposal down to only have public surveillance cameras? I'm getting tired. <laughs> Uh, at only at the intersections. These are not areas of high crime, and I'm having a problem with that. This change ranges serious and concerning questions and gives rise to great concerns. 
And also I have read and reading in the Gazette that if the ordinance passes and a second reading tonight, our mayor will veto it. I have a lot of respect for our mayor. And my question is, why did our mayor only tell the Gazette and not bring it forth to us counselors and do respect to all of us? There were meetings and I wish <coughs> that I had our mayor who came to us first before just going to the Gazette and not coming to our sunny counselors. And I've had people who have called me on that. Businesses are free to install their own surveillance cameras. We value our business community and want it to thrive. But it's not fair to have the taxpayers fund a proposal that outside of the business community is very unpopular citywide. Most importantly, given that we so strongly value our business community, and I do support it because I come from a business family, we need to recognize that public surveillance cameras could have a, ne a negative effect on the business community, as people may choose to go to other communities that don't spy on its residents, visitors, and workers. And I can't tell you the calls that I have gotten within the past two weeks of people actually telling me, my friends and some people who own businesses, of losing people because of this being placed. This proposal would virtually destroy our sanctuary city status and would cause fear amongst our immigrant community. It would lay the mayor's trust policy to waste. And that's my feelings toward that. I also want to thank Chief Jody Casper and her police officers for everything that they do in our city to keep us all safe. But I cannot agree with what you want to do with placing surveillance cameras on Main Street at the intersection. When we talk about community policing, I feel since our Chief Jody Casper and I have talked by email of my concerns of her feelings toward community policing in one of her chapters in her book that was mentioned to be by, by some residents, Chief Casper explained to me thoroughly of the difference between the two. So I would suggest that the cost of the surveillance cameras be put in place with foot patrol or bike patrol officers on Main Street. So there was a difference in her book about community policing. So I, as a counselor, asked her. I wanted clarification on that language. So we need to be careful here between community policing, and now we need to say we want to have foot patrol or bike patrol on Main Street. So let's use that $80,000 to $100,000 on a position of where it should be. I feel that police surveillance criminalizes poverty and disproportionately affects immigrants, people of color, the working class, the LGBTQ folks, and those who are houseless or have disabilities. I feel that also the Chamber of Commerce, I have a lot of respect for them. I think they do just marvelous for the city of Northampton. But why, my question is, why have they not also scheduled a meeting with the business people and the public? Why not? It's open. It's open to this community for anybody to go ahead and have meetings. So I have concerns about the transparency on that. This really has become a deeply divided issue, and many have come to voice their differences. We have had, I have eight meetings, and everyone has had the opportunity to speak. And I respect, and I do respect of what I heard from both sides. I feel this is a civil rights issue and a human rights issue and the most vulnerable of our citizens who are being hunted by Homeland Security and Immigration Services. 
families and children will be so profoundly affected and broken apart. I support this ordinance and will vote yes. I will remain firmly opposed to surveillance cameras downtown in our city of Northampton. Please, no demonstration there, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Councilor Bidwell. Um, Yes, it has been a long time. No, no one, no one, no one could, could, could say that, uh, that a semester's worth of conversation constitutes a rush. Um, I, 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 too, want to uh, acknowledge the great many thoughtful comments that have come by way of email and the occasional phone call and, and uh, comments at, the, at these meetings. And though it's been a full-time job of late, I want folks to know I've, I've, I've read every one of them. I've responded to many. I haven't responded to every one of them, but I want you to know I do appreciate the input, and I believe I have tried to be as uh, uh, careful and uh, objective in taking in input as, as, as I could be. Um, I do want to, and I also want to say that I think folks can probably appreciate that at times it's a little, little hard to just sit here and listen and not say, well, wait a minute. Um, and um, I'm not going to do that here with the exception of one comment. Um, I think it's fair to say that probably most institutions in this society have some level of embedded institutional racism. And I think it's probably safe to say that those of us with white privilege carry around some embedded racism that we may spend a lifetime working on. Um, however, when someone says about uh, the person of our police chief um, that she speaks in terms of thinly veiled racism, that was a, a, a quote, I, I just want to go on record, since she's not here to defend herself, to say that I think that was over the line. And, and, uh, and, I, wanna, and I wanna call it out, and I think uh, uh, I think we, we, we have reason to expect better of one another than that. Um, so I, I for, for the record, and I don't want to go on at any length here because you've heard me speak before and you've read what I've written in the Gazette, et cetera. Um, I do remain um, opposed to this ordinance. Um, I th I, I've come to conclude more than ever that I think our job as city councilors, unlike the job of advocates for, for particular positions, um, I do think it's our job to balance compelling public interests. I really do believe that. That's how I take my job seriously. And I think in this case, those compelling public interests are how we weigh civil liberties against public safety issues. Um, and I, I fear that by coming down exclusively on the side of the civil liberties part of that balancing act, we send a message that we're going to leave to the mayor and to the police chief concerned about public safety. It's our job to be champions of civil liberties exclusively. I worry about that. I don't think that's the right message for us to be sending, and I don't believe it personally. Um, I do want to say about the risk that ICE and other federal authorities would get into their possession images from, from, from these cameras. Of course that's a risk. It could, it could happen now. It could have happened last year. It could happen next year. Uh, we have uh, a, a number of, of, of city cameras already. That is a constant issue. Uh, it didn't just, just emerge as part of this debate. It's been there all along. Uh, and it will remain there as a, as, a, as a real concern and one that I worry about. But I think the risk, and I think it's a fairly obscure risk of that actually taking place, has to be weighed against the, the, the possibilities of benefit from at least providing the police chief with the option of having this tool at her disposal. And when I weigh the, the, that, uh, I, I continue to come down on the side of wanting to provide the police chief with the option of, of pursuing this, uh, this approach to uh, dealing with public safety issues. And it, I think it's, point, it's worth reiterating that this, whether this, if this ordinance had never come along, 
this body would still have in full democratic process the opportunity to weigh the merits of a particular proposal for the use of cameras and through our power of the purse vote yes or no. That power, that authority of this body has always been there and will always be there. If, if the police chief wanted to propose a particular deployment of cameras, she would come to this body for approval of funding to do so. And that would be the opportunity to debate it. Uh, then we would be debating it in the context of something very specific, not something hypothetical. So I, I continue to regard the, the ordinance as, as unnecessary because even without it, there would be full opportunity for this council to debate it. Um, just one, one last thing on this, on this notion of rush, uh, rushing the process. I have never contended that um, uh, we have been rushing this process of conversation that's been going on over the last three months. My point, although the, where the rush in the process happened was that as within 48 hours of the police chief opening up a community conversation, uh, resolutions and ordinances were, were drafted and brought to this body. And I've come to believe that just the sheer process of, of putting things in writing as a resolution and as an ordinance inherently polarizes the conversation that follows. There's a very big difference between having community conversations and dialogue uh, where we're free to express our, our curiosity and want to gather information and out of that process formulate a proposal. There's a very big difference between that process and having those conversations with a fully drafted ordinance hanging over our head where we as counselors and as community members uh, are expected to say immediately, are you for it or against it? It skips over the step of open-minded curiosity and exploration out of which could come a fully formulated proposal. So it's, that's my concern about rush. The rush happened in rushing to draft ordinance and, and, and resolution, which colored and polarized and intensified the debate. So just to be clear, that's, that's my concern about rush, not all the healthy, vibrant conversations that have happened since. I will. Can I, just uh, quiet, for, Council Sherman. Um, can I just ask for quiet from the chamber? I don't know if you all know, but I can hear everything. And as been noted, we've listened to all of you for well over 20 hours silently. Mm -hmm. And I have heard through all these meetings, like the chatter and the twittering and everything. And I think we're owed the respect of quiet in the chamber when we speak. So that's my request. Thank you. Uh, Council Murphy. Mm -hmm. And. I've not actually spoken my point of view on this yet through all, all of these meetings, really, uh, because most of the time I was chairing legislative matters and I tried really hard to be a chair and to listen to people and not really state a position. <coughs> um, and then I missed the last meeting, so I didn't get a chance to do it there. So um, I want to take the opportunity to do it now. Um, the effectiveness of camera footage shot in public spaces for later use as evidence in criminal proceedings was proven forever by the crime of the last century when an eight millimeter film taken by a bystander named Zabruder captured the detail of the Kennedy assassination. Cameras don't profile or discriminate. They simply document and timestamp what really happened in their field of view. Cameras don't replace police, police officers. They're a tool to be used to make police officers more effective like a radio or a fingerprint kit. We have listened to public comment that police body cameras would be a better choice than stationary street observation cameras. But body cameras only document what officers see. Street observation cameras document what officers don't see. Chief Casper is in charge of keep, keeping Northampton safe for everyone to enjoy. And we all agree, I think, that her department does a pretty good job. But Chief Casper has commented that in her opinion, Downtown Northampton is at a tipping point, a point where she and her department need an additional tool to help ensure a safe city that everyone can enjoy. The chief has shared with public comment the sort of activity that is broader to the conclusion that cameras are necessary. A hate crime where a woman walking downtown was told to move back to Puerto Rico by two men who then threw a rock hitting her in the head causing a head injury. An attack on Main Street where a man was beaten by four men requiring to get facial reconstructive surgery. A robbery on Main Street where a woman was grabbed from behind with a knife. It was held to her throat until she turned over her wallet. An armed <coughs> robbery at Dunkin' Donuts where the suspect fled through downtown Northampton. 
an open and gross lewdness case, seven separate incidents in, all in downtown, where a man is out seeking female victims when he's naked and masturbating. An armed robbery of Cumberland Farms where the suspect was masked and showed a handgun. This is the sort of criminal activity that Chief Casper hopes to deter by identifying and successfully prosecuting the offenders quickly with the help of evidence provided by observation cameras. Much has been made of the fact that observation cameras don't prevent crime, but the rapid arrest and successful prosecution of criminals does help to deter crime. The city just spent millions of dollars to create Pulaski Park, and a new park is magnificent. The chief indicates that there's a steady illegal drug trade going on in Pulaski Park, with many of the drugs coming in on PBTA buses. Drug sales don't happen on buses very often because the buses have cameras. Drug dealers are very aware of their surroundings, making live observation difficult. Cameras are the best solution. Observation cameras are in wide use throughout the region and the country. Westfield State University is in the process of installing 400 cameras. The University of Massachusetts uses 1,400 observation cameras on its Amherst campus. These institutions do not take civil liberties lightly, but there is no expectation of privacy in public spaces. Again, there is no expectation of privacy in public spaces. This is a settled legal principle. This ordinance is not necessary. What it is is a political statement, a political statement that has proven very decisive. It has festered bullying and threats of boycotts all over an ordinance that is not necessary. The council can control the installation of municipal observation cameras simply by not funding them. No money, no cameras. I believe Chief Casper is justified in her request for observation cameras, and the mayor is justified in supporting her request. And for these reasons, I do not support this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Councilor Klein. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank everybody that spoke. Um, all sides of the debate, I really appreciate it. I think it really does enrich our democracy, and I'm really grateful. Um, I just wanted to address a couple of things that I heard um, amongst my colleagues, and then I have a few remarks um, that are a little bit more general. Um, I heard Councillor Bidwell use the term balancing competing interests, public safety versus civil liberties. And so I just want to look at what the definition of public safety is for a minute. Um, you know, is it panhandling? Is it theft from stores? Um, I, I feel like public safety has to be applied to all, all the residents of the city, all the people who use Main Street, and all of our visitors. So if we're talking about public safety, public safety has a different meaning for people of color, for panhandlers, for people who are houseless, who live on the streets of Northampton. For them, public safety is not being surveilled. And so we're necessarily creating a hierarchy of who gets to benefit from public safety when we, we use that term as a kind of blanket term for the kinds of things that the police would pay attention to, like um, petty theft or uh, harassment or things of that nature. Public safety for people in marginalized groups in our community is not being surveilled. So if we're going to use that term public safety, let's think about it more broadly than the kind of typical ways in which it's used. Um, and then just in response to you, Councillor Murphy, just now you said that um, we need cameras in our downtown because you know drug deals aren't happening on the bus because there are cameras on the bus. So they're happening in Pulaski Park. And so that's an exact example of how crime gets displaced. It doesn't get deterred. It gets displaced by cameras. So if we decide, according to that logic, that we're going to go into Pulaski Park and we're going to put up cameras so that we don't have drug deals in Pulaski Park, they're going to move somewhere else. So I think you know, we have to go back to a lot of the language that we've heard from public comments, some things that I've talked about. When you think about addressing issues of criminality, you have to go foundational. You have to go not to putting up the cameras to kind of surveil people and apprehend after the fact. You have to think about what are the reasons that these crimes exist in the first place. And you have to um, address those kind of uh, the, the issues that undergird the reason for those crimes. Um, so those are, those are a couple things that I wanted to respond to. 
Um, I also wanted to respond to something that I've heard a little bit about um, just in the last few days that that some of the counselors here are making decisions about this issue based solely on moral absolutist values. Um, I don't even want to delve into kind of the philosophical discussion that would show the speciousness of that argument, but I think I do think it's relevant for us to, to re, I have to reiterate something that I've said a number of times here on the council floor about how I and I know my colleagues make decisions about these complex matters that we're sometimes dealing with, um, especially these matters where there's a lot of debate and there are opposing viewpoints. I do a lot of research when we're dealing with a contentious, a troubling, uh, a complex issue. I read an enormous amount. I listen to uh, voices on both sides of the debate. I take <coughs> calls and emails from constituents and other people in the community. And although, yes, I'm absolutely concerned about the erosion of personal liberties that I believe the installation of surveillance cameras in our downtown represents, and although, yes, I'm concerned about the erosion of safety <coughs> that surveillance poses for marginalized people in our community, and although, yes, I don't want to be complicit in installing mechanisms of law enforcement control in downtown in the name of safety, these positions don't just come from um, a belief system that's based on concepts of intrinsic moral value. They're a blend of my rigorous analytical examination of peer-reviewed research, meta-analyses, expert discussion, and what I learned from my colleagues in these discussions, and what I learned from <coughs> constituents and other members of the public. And yes, I do bring my own personal um, framework of ethics and values to an issue as well, as I think does anyone who is trying to navigate complex material. Um, our discussion over the last three months about the cameras is what democracy looks like to me. It's debate about what government's responsibility is to its community and what it's not. It's about allowing for public discussion just the way we've done in these past many months. Um, I think the process that we've had here shows us that democracy is alive and well in Northampton. Not everyone's going to be pleased with the outcome, of course, but that doesn't mean anyone's opinions were squelched in this <coughs> process. Um, it's been suggested that we spend, and Councillor Lombard spoke about this, that we spend taxpayer dollars on something that studies that were carried out over many years and that were meta-analyzed for their aggregate averages indicate the camera surveillance has no statistically significant effect on crime rates. We have seen this over and over again in <coughs> studies since the early 2000s when, um, when the UK started doing studies on their mass surveillance. The first home office study, and um, I know that Councillor O'Donnell has spoken to these studies and we heard from in public comment about um, home office studies. The home office is the, uh, the federal or the national uh, agency in the UK that oversees all uh, issues around crime. The first study that they did in August 2002 surveyed 22 studies, so it was a meta-analysis meta of the effects of CCTV in both the US and the UK. Um, it, the meta-analysis showed that cameras showed no significant impact on crime. Uh, more recent follow-up studies and meta-analyses in the UK continue to show the same thing. The American studies that met the criteria for their 2004 <coughs> meta-analysis in the, in the, uh, the home office um, showed worse outcomes than those in the UK. Um, so that means that they showed an undes undesirable or null effect on crime. So those are the studies that made it into the meta-analysis that was done in 2004 in the UK. Um, the last thing I want to say is I think we have to have some kind of standard for decision making about these things. And I, I've been kind of racking my brain for different kind of um, decision-making approaches that I've learned about over the years. Mm -hmm. And I came upon something um, that I studied years ago in, when I was studying philosophy. John Lango, who's a professor um, emeritus at um, Hunter College, and he's Yale University trained, he created a standard to examine the necessity of an action that I think could be really useful to our discussion. 
He says that one of two fundamental criteria need to be met to justify the necessity of an action or decision. The first is the feasibility standard, which is fulfilled when there's sufficient evidence to suggest that there is no feasible alternative. <coughs> the second is the awfulness standard, which is when the alternatives are worse than the proposed course of action. So using this framework of decision making with what we know about the pitfalls surrounding surveillance, um, I think we have to acknowledge that we need to limit the use of surveillance cameras in our city. Thanks. <coughs> Anyone else wish to speak to this? Uh, hang on a second. You have spoken, and yeah. Councilor Nash. <coughs> yeah, I'm going to be pretty quick. I hope. <laughs> but um, you know, I, I remain 60/40 on this. That um, you know, in in favor of the ordinance, I, I see the value of of um, having cameras. Um, I also realize the, the risk, uh, what gets risked when we do install them. And, um, and I feel we're making a trade-off here. At least that's where my vote is going to be, that, um, that um, you know, that um, uh, the, the night of Chief Casper's meeting, I was speaking with somebody after, afterwards. You know, in some areas of the country, when they feel unsafe, they go out and get guns. Well, here in Northampton, we're going to maybe <coughs> not have cameras. And I, I think that that's a, um, I think that, you know, says a lot about who we are. Um, I also, um, I want to speak directly to the ordinance here in that, um, that through the process, what we have is, it is something that it doesn't ban cameras. It bans 24-7 cameras. It's, it's not going to... Uh, stop uh, the police using cameras in emergency situations <coughs> for events or for any investigations um, so that the, the the police will be able to do everything they're doing now with and with the addition of cameras both downtown and wherever else they need them in the city so um, and the the last thing is I, I want to say is I want to thank everybody for all of their um, their input and, and uh, feedback, and um, and my hope is that you know that I, that um, that you know I sense that there's some tension. <laughs> there's some tension, and, and it's and I, I I'm not sure what it is, but I do hope that uh, people can um, <coughs> you know can reach across that divide and just do a little talking because I know. I've talked to all of you, and there's some really, you're all great people, and I, I just, you know, it's like, I, I just hope that there's a way to, you know, kind of move beyond that tension. So I'm going to be voting uh, for the ordinance. Thank you. Councilor O'Donnell, you haven't spoken yet. I'm okay. You have any interest in speaking? Councilor Murphy, you have a follow-up? Just, uh, just one follow-up, because I did, I really wanted to understand, you know, the, this began with Chief Casper. It began with her saying, I feel that, that, that the tables are tipping away from my favor to control my city. And I said, you know, can you ex explain that to me a little, a little more? And, and it's, it's interesting given the comments that, are, that came here tonight. She said, I'm responsible for the safety of a city with substantial minority populations. She said, I have gay and lesbian people. I have homeless people. I have minority people, I have immigrants, I have students, I have a large Jewish community, I have people with mental illnesses. And she said, there are people, maybe not in Northampton, that regionally may choose to want to make a statement and do violence to one of those communities. And they know they're here. And I'm responsible for their safety. And they're going to come to my community if they want to do something violent to make a statement. And I got to try and protect these communities. And it's, it's really interesting to me that tonight, people are shaking their heads saying, I'm more concerned about the cameras than I, are, than I am concerned with what Chief Casper's worried about, which is somebody's going to come here and do something to a member of your community, and I'm not going to be able to do anything about it. And I got a feeling this ordinance is going to pass. I'm just concerned that at some point we're going to be discussing this again after some terrible incident has occurred. But it seems to be the direction we want to go in, so we'll wait and see what happens. Uh, if I may, the, 
I haven't had a chance to talk yet, so. Um, actually, so originally, Councillor O'Donnell said early on, and we've, we've reiterated it, and, and it hasn't gotten much purchase, but um, point of fact, there's not a ban. And in fact, actually, the divisiveness that was defined was not a, did not come as a result of the ordinance came. It, it existed. It wasn't the genesis of this moral debate and this balance of conflict. There were these competing interests existed and didn't manifest as clearly and eloquently and sometimes ineloquently here in this chamber as a result of the ordinance. It is not a ban. It is a stopgap measure. And point of fact, actually, I'm going to spin off a little bit to refer to the fact that this is legal. As Attorney Newman mentioned, actually, point of fact, this, the city solicitor has signed off on this. It's not directing policy to the police. It's actually establishing law and establishing law that does not put on a, a memorialized permanent ban on cameras. So whoever is interpreting that, you're investing too much hope in it. And for those of you who are resisting that, you're, you're resisting the wrong thing. What it does is exactly what we've been doing, is having in-depth participatory democracy discussing what the community wants or needs and trying to determine that. Um, originally, uh, the reaction from some of the community was that there was a whole silent majority that was being left unheard. Um, the point of fact, actually, is, is a number of counselors have pointed out, we've been on the receiving end of all manner of opinions relative to this issue for those who didn't feel confident or comfortable enough to speak in a public venue they wrote to us or they called us or in frequent cases accosted me while i was handing out pie to them but it's the <laughs> the fact is is that's how we affect democracy point of fact this is not an anomaly this is what we do chief casper's job is to do precisely as council murphy described our job is to serve as the point where we try to digest and figure out what's the best process and whether it's, we think it works in, in compliance with the rest of the will of the community or our moral core. Uh, I, I've never been challenged on the fact that I had s expressed something based on a moral point before. That felt really unusual. And I understand the point, I understand the concern that, that uh, if I were a doctrinaire, uh, a, a zealot of sorts, and didn't, uh, was not inclined to have an open mind about the issue. But we start from a moral point, I hope. I mean, that's why, I mean, representative governance is you put yourself out there, you say, this is my ethos, love me or leave me. And then the community invests in your ethos and either continues to support it by keeping you in office if you get elected, or knocking you out. That's what it is. And respecting our ability to, to, to be open-minded and deliberate. Being more, starting from a moral point doesn't mean you're be, not being open-minded. Point in fact, actually, um, this process actually did not happen 48 hours previous, uh, at, subsequent to the announcement. Uh, Councilor O'Donnell and I had a conversation along with Councilor Shera with the police chief and the, and the mayor uh, months before because the, one of the test cameras was put up. The, uh, one of the uh, companies was making a show of their product and that caused us some concern and we went to address some of our concerns with the mayor and with the chief of police and actually at the time discussed what would be the appropriate response, however this proceeds, the hope. Now, there are a number of things, there's a lot, been a lot of hyperbole, um, I, and a lot of things that, need to, that may need to be corrected, but I think for the, for the record, um, the aggregation of uh, uh, real-time information being transmitted to the federal government actually is not taking place. Um, what actually is being transmitted is substantially smaller. Fingerprint analysis, I think there's some other items that um, go into the Fusion Center databases. Video is not one of them. Uh, first of all, 
right now the technology doesn't exist that would, they could support the capacity of information that that would require. But as a matter of policy, we can actually, the mayor, and hopefully the mayor will consider this, can establish policy uh, where <clears throat> allowing the police department and the mayor to resist any request for that data, but right now no policy, such policy exists. And that would require the federal government to come with a subpoena in order to, to get that information. A little clarity on that point. So there's been hyperbole on the other side about uh, anecdotal uh, reference to actual crimes that have been committed that would pop, and then the suggestion that they would be prevented by the presence of a camera or successfully forensically prosecuted. Point of fact, every one of these crimes I heard iterated tonight would not benefit at all from the camera that's being proposed. The camera is sitting downtown at an intersection. It would not catch a hooded uh, 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 person holding up a convenience store. It wouldn't st stop a hate crime. It would not allow them to prosecute subsequently. With the remote possibility, yes, if they go through that intersection, that they, they can prove that they were in town at the time. And in fact, actually, that's what the chief has suggested. This is an, an additional enhancement tool. I absolutely agree with that. When the chief came to us, it was with a question mark. It was a request. Not all question marks, not all requests are honored. It's the reason it's a question. If it's a foregone conclusion, then bada boom. But it's coming. The chief recognized and understood, as did the mayor, I presume, um, <coughs> that there was a question to be asked of the community. <coughs> and w our obligation was to provide the opportunity to have that conversation in a democratic process. Now back to the ban issue. All this does, it's a speed hump, if you will. It will require each subsequent request for cameras to go through this process. This process, which actually I think has been one of the most edifying, most expansive, most thoughtful processes we've in, engaged in in a long time. I think if we had, sent out an invitation for a community conversation about this issue, I don't think we would receive the level of attendance and participation discussion. And besides, how, what we actually can't do that. We can't preside over something like that. It has to be introduced in a democratic process without previous discussion among the quorum of this body. We did the right thing by the process. I believe, I firmly believe and reject wholly that this process was flawed, incorrect, immoral, and predetermined. Every law and ordinance that comes before us automatically presumes that there's a division of thought. It doesn't always, it's not always the case. And we're going to second vote on a lot of ordinances that I don't think you'll see reflected in that a divided vote. The fact that a division exists doesn't mean that the process is flawed. It means it's actually healthy. And we're better for it. And regardless, by the way, as I said, so the, this ordinance, should it pass, is not going to offer the protections that people hope that that does. If it fails, it's also not going to offer the protections that people think. <coughs> but from my point, in the, my original impetus for uh, joining Councillor O'Donnell and Councillor Klein on this, uh, sponsoring this, it's the old camel's nose under the tent analogy. Now, some would argue the camel's nose is well under the tent, and the camel is, of course, compelled to continue to move forward until it's in the tent and you can't get it out. And that may well be. But as Councillor Klein said, I don't want to be part of a body that's complicit in allowing that camel to get further into the tent. And that's what this was. That's what this is. That's where we are. That's the conversation. I am proud of this debate. I am proud of the input from every sentient creature who came before us. It's, it's ugly. It's messy. Feelings get hurt. It's the right process. It works inelegantly and not conclusively. But it works because this is how we govern ourselves. 
So, um, any other comments, discussion? Councilor Klein? I just wanted to say something really brief, and that is, again, Councilor Murphy, you um, cited something that uh, Chief Casper said about protecting different groups. and. Um, I definitely fall into the category of at least two of the groups that you cited, and to use an overused phrase, not in my name. I mean, I don't, um, I don't want to be protected with surveillance cameras as a queer person, as a Jew, and whatever the other categories were that I might fit into there. And um, I would imagine that a lot of um, people that also self-define in those categories would say the same thing. So, you know, being told that somehow I'm going to be protected with these cameras just doesn't sit right with me. Okay. Um, okay to call the roll on this? Yes, roll call. Okay, roll call, please. Councilor Goodwell. No. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Fine. Yes. <coughs> Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. No. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. All right, that passes in second reading. Yeah. Um, uh, well, recess? And there's been a call for recess, so uh, there we go. You got nine minutes. Great. <laughs> Not a recess for two weeks? Okay. We're, uh, we're back out of recess and we're back and we're on the items. Now we're up to the consent agenda and in, contained in the consent agenda is to approve the minutes of November 16th, 2017. Also an application for supervised display of fireworks, Pyrotechnic Works Incorporated. Uh, hopefully you've all had a chance to review these documents. Uh, appointments to various committees with positive recommendation from City Services on December 4th, 2017. It's Park and Recre Recreation Commission, uh, Julia Chevin of A Cosmian Avenue in Florence. Uh, the term to start October 2017, expiring in June 2020. It's a reappointment. On the Agricultural Commission, we have Timothy, Timothy Smith of 80 Locust Street in Northampton. The term starting September 2017, expiring June 2020, also a reappointment. And also, a, an appointment, item 17.418, is an appointment to the Arts Council with a positive recommendation from City Services on December 4th, 2017. And that's Arts Council Jonah Zuckerman, 82 Jackson Street, Northampton, the term to start October 2017, expiring June 2020. Again, another reappointment. Motions made and seconded. And all those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Now we go into another recess, but this one's actually a busy one. We're going uh, busy-ish. Uh, uh, this is a recess to go into finance, and uh, Council Murphy is presiding. Thank you very much. Laura, would you call the roll of finance, please? Laura. Present. Councilor Labarge. Present. Councilor Nash. Yes. Excellent. We are all here. So the first item is to approve minutes of November 16th, 2017. Second. Second. Any discussion? Any corrections? All in favor? Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Uh, we have some financial orders tonight. Uh, the first one is uh, 17429, in order to appropriate funds from free cash to stabilization and capital stabilization. Order that $1 million be appropriated from the FY18 general fund undesignated fund balance to the following accounts, $500,000 to the capital stabilization fund and $500,000 to the stabilization fund. Do we have a motion to finance? Make, make a motion. Second. And the mayor is here to tell us about it. Uh, yes, good evening, councillors. Uh, these are uh, very uh, typical uh, tr uh, transfers that we've done the last several years. So um, DOR did certify our free cash for our various accounts. Um, for the general fund, uh, the, our, our undesignated fund balance, or as it's called, free cash, uh, was certified at 4.1 million, actually $4,175,642. Um, which is about 4.5% of the general fund. Um, our target every year is to be between three and 5%, so that's right in that, uh, right 
right there, between 3 and 5%. Um, and so what we typically do every year when it's first certified is we put uh, allotments into, uh, into our stabilization and our capital stabilization. So we're proposing to uh, move 500 into each of those two accounts. Um, that will still leave us uh, $2.5 million, um, a portion of which we'll use as part of the capital uh, plan when we bring forward the capital improvement program. Um, and then we will also will have a healthy reserve, you know, over a million dollars that we'll have in case of uh, a bad winter uh, and we have, you know, snow and ice that we need to be able to reimburse snow and ice or any other kinds of contingencies like that. But typically snow and ice is why we uh, maintain a balance over the winter time. And then typically, what's left of that, we'll come back to you toward the end of the fiscal year to move any unexpended free cash in, again, into capital stabilization um, and uh, stabilization. That's sort of been our policy the last several years. So this is the first of those transfers. All right, any questions for the mayor? Again, this is something that typically happens at this time of year after free, cra free cash is certified. Well, hearing no questions, all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Any calls? All right, the next is 17430. This is in order to appropriate free cash to the Northampton Public Schools <coughs> Kinney Vento Transportation Fund. Order that $19,499 be appropriated from the FY General Fund undesignated fund balance to the Northampton Public Schools McKinney <coughs> Transportation <coughs> Fund. Uh, to provide the schools with the reimbursement from the Commonwealth, which was received by the city for the transportation of homeless students in FY17. We have a motion in? Make a motion. Second. Okay. All right. Again, something that um, happens typically right after free cash is certified. Um, it's been our policy to, um, the way that it gets reimbursed to us is it basically gets <coughs> put into our free cash, our overall free cash. And so, it's been our policy to then reappropriate it back to the school. So this is actually um, uh, reimbursement for transporting homeless children who go to school in Northampton but live in another community. Um, and there's a reimbursement program for that. Obviously, not doesn't reimburse enough, but it does provide some reimbursement. So we're just re we're we're reimbursing um, NPS for this money that came back to the city um, to pay for that. So they give it to, to the city side, and then we just transferred over to the schools yes and they're expecting it yes all right any questions for the mayor on this one nope then all in favor of a positive recommendation aye. please say aye. Aye. aye aye any opposed all right the next one is 17413 in order to transfer funds from the landfill closure fund to the solid way cell one the three one account order that one hundred thousand dollars be transferred from the landfill closure trust fund to the solid way cell one closure account for the ongoing closure related expenses. Do we have a motion to finance? Make a motion. Second. All right. This one's pretty straightforward. Again, um, and the, the landfill closure trust fund is something that we're required to set up by DEP um, as part of the ongoing monitoring of the landfill. And uh, the, the closure account, we're basically asking to take some funds out of the closure account uh, to be able to pay for ongoing um, activities, monitoring, and some other. Um, things that are necessary to do that. So uh, this is, again, funds that we've set aside uh, for the landfill closure. And the idea is that you draw it over 20, 30 years to be able to do the closure activities. And we were required, when we closed the landfill, to have set up this account and to have it at a level that could be sustained over you know, the, the, the period of time in which we'd have to be doing this active monitoring. So we're using the fund for its intended purpose. Exactly, yes. So Questions for the mayor on this one? Councilor. Just curious, roughly, what, what is the balance of that fund now? Do you, is it? That's right. I, uh, I thought you would ask that. Um, let's see. I don't think it's on this one. Let's see. Oh, it's on the um, chart. Oh, that's right. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, there it is. Okay. The, um, the balance today is two million. One thousand nine hundred and ninety-two dollars. Yeah. So at hundred grand a year, that's it's still gonna. Yeah. It'll have a balance of one point nine million after this withdrawal. So yeah, the the idea was yeah. they have some kind of a formula um, for how much it costs to maintain yeah. one of these systems, and so when we closed it, we were required to set this money aside, and you know, so we're slowly drawing from it every year. Yeah. Um, any other questions? 
Then all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please aye. say aye. 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 Opposed? Right, the next is 17423. In order to transfer FY 2018 <coughs> Water Enterprise retained earnings to the water and sewer stabilization and vehicle replacement, order that $700,000 be transferred from the FY 18 Water Enterprise retained earnings into the Water Stabilization Fund, and that $42,202 be transferred from the FY 18 Sewer Enterprise retained earnings into the operating budget line item vehicle replacement and that $650,000 be transferred from the FY18 sewer enterprise retained earnings into the, the sewer stabilization fund. We have a motion on this one? I make a motion. Second. All right. So um, when DOR certifies our free cash, they not only certify it for the general fund, um, but they also certify it for our four other enterprise funds. Um, in the context of the enterprise funds, they refer to it as retained earnings is sort of the, the terminology, but it's basically the free cash um, from those accounts. Um, and you may recall uh, a few years ago, um, we made the determination that we wanted to set up um, uh, stabilization funds for each of the enterprise fund accounts and so um, rather than just having it be in a retained earnings account but to actually set it aside like we do with the general fund um, so basically what we're doing is from the retained earnings from water and sewer we're asking to move you know 700,000 from water um, into the water stabilization fund and then the 650 um, from sewer into the sewer stabilization fund the middle transfer um, is more of a kind of a technical correction. Um, when we uh, did uh, purchases for vehicle replacement for FY18, um, there were some vehicles that were, had not yet been purchased by the end of the year, um, but the then new business manager, at the DPW, forgot to encumber them, which basically means you, you've got a purchase, you've got a contract, and you're allowed to basically encumber them, encumber the money so that it doesn't go away at the end of the fiscal year. Um, those monies weren't encumbered, and so when, when June 30th came, it got closed out to free cash. Um, but we still need to purchase those vehicles, and so we're basically saying we want to take that money back out of free cash and put it back into that account. So that's what that $42,000 one in the middle is, is to basically replenish that vehicle replacement fund uh, for the 42000 that hadn't yet been spent, um, but got kind of ejected into free cash. Okay, well, that's what I, I, yeah. to be clear, and, yeah. and I we had already approached that it wasn't, the unencumbered funds didn't go off to subsidize something else. No. It just no. went back to free yeah. cash. Because basically what free cash means is that any money that was not uh, spent not during yeah. the budget year yeah. um, <coughs> gets, gets converted Swept into this in free cash account. Okay. Um, and the way to keep it from being swept is that if you do have, you know, it's okay to have a purchase that goes beyond June 30th, but you're supposed to encumber the money and basically say, we have a contract, we're going to buy it. It's just not going to be bought exactly by June 30th. Right. Um, no, my only concern was yeah. if, if it was unencumbered, did it suddenly become liquid and was assigned to something else? But yeah, no, you no. answered the, yeah. Yeah, thank not you. at all. So it's, it's, it's sort of the same 42000 that that was sitting there in FY18. We're just going to put it back where it belongs so that they can finish that procurement process. Um, so that's those are what those two are for. And um, again, just something that we've done, started to do, especially since we set up these uh, stabilization accounts a couple of years ago. Other questions for the mayor? Hearing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation of financing, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and the last one's a little bit different. The last one is 17433. It's in order to establish a $1,000 threshold for personal property tax exemption. Whereas personal property is subject to local property taxation in Massachusetts, unless specifically exempted by law, uh, depending on the ownership entity or the use of the property, and whereas tangible personal property consists of goods, merchandise, equipment, tools, machinery, and furnishings, and the and effects and other movable property, and whereas all personal property owned by Ma owned by Massachusetts and non-Massachusetts residents and businesses that are situated in Massachusetts on January 1 are taxable unless an exemption applies, and whereas Mass General Law 59, Section 5, 
54 allows for a local option exemption for small personal property accounts in municipalities that accept this section and further requires that the municipality uh, will establish a minimum fair cash value required for personal property accounts to be taxed and to modify that value from time to time. And whereas setting the minimum property value for personal property subject to taxation at $1,000 would eliminate the issuance of quarterly personal property tax bills of such low value that the cost of processing them effectively exceeds the charge. Uh, therefore, order that the City of Northampton hereby accepts the provision of Mass General Law, Chapter 59, Section 554, and in accordance therewith establishes a minimum value of personal property subject to taxation at $1,000. Do we have a motion? Make a motion. Second. Second. This is an initiative that the finance director has developed, so I want to have her explain it to you and talk to you about it. Okay, so um, the Board of Assessors also, in addition to real estate, assess personal property. And right now the threshold is zero. So all personal property that any business reports is taxable. Um, under this statute, we're allowed to set a minimum, and the Board of Assessors uh, and, and the mayor are recommending that we set that at $1,000. That's about 19% of our counts. Um, it will, uh, it is 244 bills, but they are sent four times a year, so this is sent four times. So this will eliminate about 950 bills. And the bills range on an annual basis from 33 cents to $16. So when you cut, you know, divide that over four quarters, we're sending out bills for eight cents up to $4. So this will eliminate kind of those ridiculously small bills that we do. Um, we will forego about $2,500 in revenue, but the postage on 950 bills alone is $500, and then there's the processing costs. The other part that's difficult is, you know, people get a very small bill in the mail. It's 50 cents. It's a dollar. They forget about it. And then as soon as it's late, they get a $25 demand fee on a bill that was eight cents. And so it doesn't really make sense. Um, so this will um, basically allow us not to have to process and log almost a thousand transactions. Um, and it just makes sense because it's just not gonna penalize very tiny businesses that have very small amounts of equipment. Just to be clear, this doesn't exempt the first one thousand dollars of any any Correct. group. This is only people who have something um, any any value any property that doesn't reach the threshold of a thousand dollars in value. You can go as high as ten thousand in this, but you know we did an evaluation and we felt this was the most reasonable step to make. And and just the the real dollars and personal property of the utility companies. There, that's a very lucrative for personal property, but these little ones truly do cost more in in manpower and postage than ever comes back from them. So this is a really good, this is a really good thing. Right, and you, and then you're not going to hear why is the city sending me a bill for thirty three cents? Mm -hmm. You know. So Susan keeps saying thirty three cents or whatever. But then I just heard our council president talking about we have the property in a business, okay, and if it's right up to a thousand dollars, then you get exempt. You will you will not get a personal property bill if the personal property that you report on your form of list is valued at a thousand or less. So, so but if you have two thousand dollars worth of property you will still be taxed on that two thousand dollars worth of property so any other questions on this one I, I guess oh come I just want to say this is great because mm -hmm. this is the kind of stuff that people say oh my god I can't believe the city government does this and that we're getting rid of this is, mm -hmm. this is great it will we'll cut down on the number of angry people at the assessor's counter wondering you know why they Got a dollar twenty-five bill and a twenty-five dollar penalty for not having right. remembered to pay it. You right, because the twenty-five dollar demand fee can't be prorated. So no, and it can't be, it can't be excused prorated. either. Right. You know, right. and if you don't pay that one, it comes around again. You right. know, so, uh, counselor. 
May I ask just a really brief question? I guess it's a conceptual question. Um, to what extent are electronic billing um, techniques ever used? You know, I, I'm not suggesting we do it or we need to do it, but I'm just curious because if, if saving postage is the issue, like, is it ever set up that way? Oh, you mean sending our bills out electronic? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that, I, I believe with Munis we would have that capability, mm -hmm. but, um, I'm, you know, we're still at the stage of getting people to be able to make more payments online electronically. I mean, mm -hmm. we already have real estate and a number of other ones, but we're still at that stage. But, you know, that is something that we talk about at Financial Team is, is okay. when, you know, when are we ready to do that step because mm -hmm. that, that would make a lot of sense. Interesting. So. Thank you. So when, when they do that, the taxpayer has <coughs> to pay more than the face value because they have to pay the credit card fee because the city has to collect the amount of tax due. So if you owe $1,000, we can't collect $1,000 minus the credit card fee. Right. If we have to get the 1000 and they have to pay the credit card fee on top of that right. as, a cur as a convenience to be able to pay it online. Right, but you can also pay online through your bank, yeah. and then it's only, I think, what, a $25? 25 cents. 25, 25 cents. Excuse me, 25 cents yes. fee. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but if you like do if you use do your debit. credit card, yeah, you yeah, have yeah. to. But that's not the case with all of the city's mm -hmm. transactions. You know, some transactions the city does absorb the credit card fee, like mm -hmm. like parking. So like parking. Yeah. It's only real estate because we but have in to. In taxes, collect. you have to collect. The you have to exact collect amount. everything you said you were going to collect. Yes, so. you can't deduct the credit card fee. Any other questions on this one? Uh, hearing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. And I know of no other business coming before us, so. Move to adjourn. Perfect. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Come out of recess and head into the financial orders. So first up is item 17.422. This is an order for budgetary transfer. Number one for this FY 2018. It's a second Move. reading. Second. Motions made by Councilor Barge and seconded by Councilor Um Discussion on this item? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Bigwell. Yes. <coughs> Passes in second reading. Item seventeen point four two three. That's an order to authorize the purchase of five and a quarter acre parcel. The second reading. Second. Motions made by Labarge, seconded by O'Donnell. Discussion? Roll call. Okay. Dwight. Yes. 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 All right, that passes in second reading. Um, item 17.424, it's an order to authorize payment of a prior year bill. Uh, this is second reading. Move approval. Motion by O'Donnell, is there a second? Second. Second by Shara. Uh, discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labar. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. And Councilor Dwight. Yes. Uh, that passes in second reading. Item 17.429, that's an order to appropriate free cash uh, to stabilization and capital stabilization. This is the first reading for this one. Second. Motion by Labarge, seconded by O'Donnell. Uh, discussion with, of course, the positive recommendation from finance that you experienced just moments ago. Moments ago. No? Roll call, please. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. 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 Passes in first reading. It will be uh, reviewed, revisited at our last meeting for this term. Uh, item 17.430, in order to appropriate free cash to NPS McKinney Vento uh, Transportation Fund. First reading. That was a motion from Councilor Labarge. Second. And seconded by Councilor O'Donnell. Uh, further discussion? Okay, Laura. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? 
Yes. 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 All right. Passes in first reading. And Council LaBarge, too. All right. Item 17.431. It's a transfer from the landfill uh, closure fund to the solid waste cell account. Second. Motions made by Bidwell, seconded by Council LaBarge. Uh, discussion? Roll call, please. Yes. <laughs> no, don't mess things up. <laughs> Come down. Yes. 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 All right. Passes in first reading. Item 17.432 is in order to transfer retained earnings to water and sewer stabilization vehicle replacement. First reading. Second. Motion by Labarge. Seconded by. <coughs> Discussion. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. All right. That passes in first reading. Item mm -hmm. seventeen point four three three. It's in order to establish one thousand dollar threshold for personal property tax exemption. First okay. reading. Second. Motion by Labarge. Second by O'Donnell. Further discussion on this. Uh, roll call, please. Councillor Shearer. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Dash. Yes. And Councillor Yes. Okay. That passes in first reading. Um, next up, we have ordinances. Uh, first one up is item 17.351. This is an ordinance to clarify the large ground mounted arrays. Uh, fall within the use of category of private utility if not otherwise specified separately. Positive recommendation legislative matters in October 16, 2017. Second reading, Councilor Labarge has made a motion. Second. Uh, the Councilor Klein has <laughs> seconded it. Uh, the the large ground, uh, ground mounted arrays, they're solar arrays, just for clarity's sake. Not just any array of, you know, lawn ornaments. Unicorns. <laughs> the corns do that will work on that with lots of process um discussion no roll call please Councilor Bidwell. yes Councilor yes Councilor Dwight. yes 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 that passes in second reading Item 17.367, this is an ordinance to amend uh, section 156, subsection 5A plus 5C to allow uh, CBA oversight uh, over some exempt projects and to modify some exemptions. This is a positive recommendation for legislative matters on November 13, 2017. It is a second reading. Second. Motion's made. Seconded. Uh, further discussion? Roll call, please. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Sheriff. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. All right. That passes in second reading. Item 17.370 on an ordinance to amend parking zone time limit and class on Green Street. Um, this is also, what's that? Yeah, that was just going to ask. <coughs> we have a collection here of parking. Uh, Ordinances that maybe could be moved as a group if people were disposed that way. Mm. Is that your pleasure? So that brings us up to sound you. pleasant to me. Sound pleasant to you? It does kill a page. <laughs> if, uh, I, I mean, if it takes us down to item all G. Things, right? Team Not objection. They all received. Yeah, they all passed last time. And, and they're right. all. This is second reading on all of them, right? Yeah. So this is C through G. Move those as a group. Motions second. made to move. Enlightened motion. And I will. I will. If you'll indulge me, I'll just uh, so we're moving as a group. Item 17.370, an ordinance to amend parking zone time limit in class on Green Street. Um, we're also item 17.375, an ordinance relative to parking on Franklin Street. Item uh, 17.376 is an ordinance relative to parking on Main Street. Item 17.377, this is an ordinance relative to parking on Con Street. 
and item 17.378 an ordinance relative to parking on Henshaw Avenue all these are approved in first reading this is second reading um, so the motion to move make a motion to approve them as a group second second, second. Well, I oh. thought I already okay. I'll we got, second. We got, we got yeah. seconds out the wazoo. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll Any discussion on these items? <laughs> Roll call, please. Yes. 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 All right. Those are all approved in second reading. Councilor O'Donnell. Why don't we take the remaining items as a group as well? Oh, you madman. All right. <laughs> Let's see. That's items. Uh, <laughs> wow. Wait. You got a date? So that's, yes. uh, that's item uh, H through L, right? Does that look right? Yeah. No, we did J, right? No, we didn't. Yeah, yes, we did J. We did so, the, yes. Did J. <laughs> so, wow. Okay. So, I'll, here we go. We did J. Yes, we did, Jay. Uh, yeah. I should have done that in the beginning. Remember that? Remember that when we did, Jay? That yeah. was great. <laughs> okay, so, uh, <laughs> Remind me how it went. <laughs> <laughs> Item 17.383. Uh, uh, this is an ordinance to refine uh, project categories for which local historic district review is required. Item 17.390. Uh, that's an ordinance to amend the zoning map of uh, 350-3.4 to expand highway business district on North King Street. Uh, item 17398, this is an ordinance to amend provisions so that existing members of multiple member bodies are not required to approve, to be approved again by the city council prior to community preservation committee. Uh, and then item 17.399, this is an ordinance pertaining to multi-use trails. There's a motion. Make a motion. Second. Second. Motion's made and second to move them as a group. Any discussion on these items? Oh, Laura. Yes. 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 Look at that. Okay. So updates from the council president. Just a reminder. I've already reminded you, but we've got one meeting left in this term. And um, subsequent to that, then we have our organizational meeting the same day as our inaugural, which I think is tentatively scheduled at this point on the 2nd. Uh, on January 2nd, and I believe it's tentatively scheduled for 10 a.m. What? At the senior center, I believe. Some of us work. <laughs> well, so, well, and and because we need to have our organizational meeting either immediately afterwards or later in that evening, we have to figure out a schedule on that. Mm. Um, but and then because we're required by the charter to do that, just so to all we'll heads have, up. Councilman will also have a meeting on that Thursday, right? Yes, so it's separate from the organizational meeting. So. That organizational meeting is likely to be. Do we, do, do we know? It'd likely be what? When that day? At, if it's after the uh, inauguration. We can do that. We can all to scramble up the hill and come up here yeah, and do it. Do it and like since you already, and some of us are already gathered. Yeah, yeah we, no reason to make it. But I, I, I have to do that in consultation with the mayor's office and see you know how long procedures are going to take. So, so is that would that be everyone's preference? For the organizational meeting. Just as soon as possible. Just get it all the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have to have a time. <laughs> <laughs> we have done that. Have, to get some, have lunch and then. Your blood sugar. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll skip it to the mayor. I know you will. It's, it's why it's, I'm, I'm. All right, well, that leaves us adjourn. one, one other. Move to adjourn. Second. Bingo. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you, thank you, thank you.